I'm home caught, she's standing trial. Why ain't I see you round back when I was down? I'm home caught, she's standing trial. Why ain't I see you round back when I was down? They ain't believing me in the beginning. Who wanna hang around now they see me winning? I'm home caught, she's standing trial. Why ain't I see you round back when I was down? What's up, world? It's your boy, Big Court, from the Holding Court Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Uncle P's Pancake and Waffle Mix. It's available in all grocery stores nationwide. This is Black-owned. This is ours. Product outweighs talent every day. So remember, there's no limit to your success. Uncle P's Pancake Mix, available right now. Man, welcome to the Holding Court Podcast with your boy Big Court and my homeboy producer Ken. What's up, Ken? Uh, what Ken, up? Ken. What up, what up? It's cracking Kansas City, the Sacramento, the Chilling. LA, the Compton. <laughs> hey, I got a special guest in the house today, man. And when I say special guest, I mean that, right? Old friend of mine, old comrade. We got to welcome him home. You know what I'm saying? Compton's finest. You know what I mean? <laughs> Most definitely. Gorilla man. Black. Welcome home. Man. man, thank you, man. Thank you, man. It's been a long time, man, and shit. It's been a long time with yeah. me and your ass here. Yeah, so, man. <laughs> you know, but we, people don't know, man. We go way back, man. You know, way, way, way back like cornrows, man. Hey, you know? real talk. Man, we go back at least 15, 20 years. So, Absolutely, man, Beautiful bro. thing. Beautiful. Listen, man, when I, I, I didn't even know you was home, bro. Right, I, right. I seen you on Vlad TV, you know what I'm saying? Congratulations mm-hmm. to coming home and hitting the ground running. You know right, what I'm saying? Right, right, right. Back in the game. Um, I seen you on Vlad, bro. I got excited. I was like, damn, my <laughs> nigga home. I was like, bro, I got I to gotta holler at him. I got to right, holler at him. Right, so right. I reached out to you, you know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. And I'll be honest with you, we hadn't seen each other in so long. And like you just said, you know, you was yeah. like, man, last time I seen you, nigga, you had the long braids and nigga, you, boy, you was like Snoop, you know what I'm saying? I you had corn rolls. I, I was like, hold man. on, this nigga ain't going to know who oh, I am. Man, my nigga was on you some real life pimp shit back then, man. You was going to get a bag. I said, You okay. know what I'm saying? But shit, yeah, man, definitely. We we had a, a beautiful, you know, meeting up. And from there, man, we made a lot of good music. And so definitely, man, it's, damn, I didn't even know it's been that long. Man, it's been 15 years, brother. 15, 16, yeah. Yeah, 15, 16 it's, years, yeah 16 years, yeah. Oh, so. six. Was, yeah, that was 06. 06. That was 06, 06. exactly. Damn, they go right. pimping. He back on it. Yeah. 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 I, I so. did the BTS. I remember being there. Right. Yeah. 06. Yeah. 06. 06. Yeah. So for all of y'all, man, listen, I, you know, everybody know me from my No Limit days and my independent days. Right. Oh, you stayed right. on your grind. Me and his brother did a song called Gangster Court Dog featuring Gorilla Black, so y'all go check that out. Please YouTube. do. Please do. Please do. Yeah, that's definitely uh, classic. Yeah. Classic. So, so, man, let's start from the beginning, bro. Right. You know, you have a a, a very compelling uh, story. You know right, a very interesting story. Right, too, right. You know what I mean, man, I want to start from the beginning, dog. Mm-hmm. Where 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 are you from? Where man, you I'm from up? Harlem, man, but I grew up in Compton. Okay. So you know, when the, you say Harlem, Harlem, I'm from you know Harlem Crips. So okay. definitely, I mean, I'm saying you born and raised in Los Angeles. Yeah, I'm born. I wasn't born and raised in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. but I want to let everybody know that I came. I was born in Chicago. Okay. And as a young boy, my mother um, ended up migrating from Chicago down to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And so maybe about a year or two later, she ended up coming to California. So this is like 89. So um, from there, you know, in 89, I never never forget the first place, you know, we moved to was Tamarind, Mm -hmm. you know, um, this is before they had the train station. Yeah. A lot of y'all remember, you know, the old Kmart. And, you know, just recently I went through there. That whole place don't even look the same. But that's how long I've been living in Compton. Mm. So, yeah. So you moved from Chicago to Compton. No, not Chicago f- to Compton. Uh-huh. From Chicago to Mississippi. To Mississippi. From Mississippi to. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. What part of Mississippi? I was down there in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Oh, Hattiesburg. So yeah, that's I got a that's lot of family down there. Yeah, Hattiesburg, Laurel, okay. all of that. And if you go further down, you got the Gulf, you got Biloxi, you got Gulfport, all of those areas ah, down there. So okay. pretty much Hattiesburg is like a little, you know. Yeah, I'm familiar with it. Exactly. With well, it. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So, so you were there to how old? To. You know, don't get me to lie, man. My memory is bad, but I know when I got out here, I was probably about eight or nine years old. I was oh, young, okay, okay. Real, real young. So when you got to L.A., you moved to L.A. or you moved to Compton from Mississippi? I moved directly to Compton, you okay. know, so we, the first place that we lived is Tamron Boulevard. Okay. So, uh, well, not Tamron Boulevard, but it's Tamron Street. So okay. if you know about Tamron, Tamron is a street pretty much 
if you go down Rosecrans, down Tamarind, back then there was a Kmart. Mm -hmm. And that Kmart, you know, no longer exists. There was a shopping center and all of that and the Martin Luther King transit station and everything like that. And so I was there before they even had the transit station, before they, you know, now if you go over there, it's not even a Kmart over there. It's just Mm -hmm. a shopping strip. Mm -hmm. You know, back then they had a circus city and all of those different things like that of that nature. So definitely. And what neighborhood is that in terms of the gang culture? Well, it's really not. It's You could, when you look at it like that, that's not a real, like, it was a lot of more Latinos that lived mm-hmm. in that area. Mm-hmm. Um, a few years later, you know, my mom ended up moving to Ponsetia in Elm, mm-hmm. which is on the other side of Willowbrook. So, well, not Willowbrook. I think that's Alameda. So on the other side of Alameda and over there is the Elm Streets. Mm-hmm. And so you got Ponsetia and Elm. And, you know, when you go back towards Rosecran, there's a Wiener Schnitzel or whatever not there. And so... You know, that's mm-hmm. their hood. That was that's always been the original right. Elm Street. Right, right, right. Which is a blood set. Yeah, it's a, well, not a blood. It's Pyro set. Pyro. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, because you know it's funny that we were saying that the uh, uh, who I have I had Chico, right. Chico Brown, and okay. we were trying to ascertain, try to figure out mm-hmm. where we knew it started as Pyro. Right. And then where did the blood come in? You know what I mean? Yeah, they always been original Pyro's over there. Right. I mean, from and when you're talking to put and when you live when you're talking about Elm, mm-hmm. Elm if anybody really know was the was one of the original original Pyro sets mm-hmm. in Compton. You know, it was Elm's looter. Mm-hmm. It was the hub of pretty much the beginning of Pyro and then it began to migrate to different parts of Compton. Mm-hmm. But Elm is an original, original Pyru hood, if you know anything about okay. Okay. That, that. Which the Pyru started on Pyru Street with mm-hmm. Pudding and Right, 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 that, right, right. But one that is one of those original places where, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of them, all of them back in the day would be over there in the Elms. Elms was one of those original places. And then you got the looters over there and then the mobs over there. And all down Rosecran, when you... If you're going down Rosecrans, it's nothing but Pyru sets. Yeah. You know, uh, the, ho- the Holly Hoods, the Lime Hoods, you know, the Fruits, the Trees, um, the West Side, you know, Pyru's, all of that is all up and down Rosecran, that whole side of town. So <clears throat> so me and you the same age. So you right. figure, uh, let's see, eight, you're talking about 84. Right. So, shit, gangbanger was in full swing. Right. So you coming from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, mm-hmm. now all of a sudden you're thrust into this, you right. know what I'm saying, this it was big a, city. It was a what culture, was that like? It was a culture shock, man. I mean, to be in a place, you know, at a young young age and, you know, the first experiences was going to, you know, Whaley. And, um, you know, my boys and them, you know, they full-fledged with it. You know, we young, you know. Mm-hmm. So this is middle school. This is eighth grade. This is, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. This is middle school. This ain't even high school. Right, right. And um, to come to a place where everybody wearing curls, Cortez, (laughs) khaki suits, you seeing the prevalent gang writing all over the place. It's like being dropped in the middle of Vietnam. Mm Mm-hmm. My mother wanted the best life for us. She only wanted the best life for us. But the realities of California, when she came here and she was able to see it, the affordability to be able to live here, she realized early out that Mississippi would be a trap and that she knew to bring her kids here, even though she didn't have the means to do what she intended on doing she knew that this would be the best life for us. And so with me, my brother Hot Dollar, you know my brother. Yeah, shout out to Hot Dollar. Definitely Hot Dollar, you know, that's my mm-hmm. that's that's Brody. Um, when she brought us here, my baby brother, she really intended to have the best life for us. She's not aware of the gang culture. She's not aware of the street violence. This this the late eighties. Niggas getting whacked. Niggas getting their shit pushed. Mm-hmm. You got the Compton swap meet, and mm-hmm. oh my God, it, they desecrated it and put a Walmart there. This yeah. is like a, this is like, <laughs> that's like taking the Eiffel Tower and putting the Walmart there. And then you got cracked too. They yeah, the whole that, yeah, you got rock. that. That well, yeah, yeah. to add that, mm-hmm. and to add gang banging, and to add money, and to add this whole element in one area like that is a ticking time bomb. Hell yeah. And so for me to be in that, my first experience is I'm running with my mans in them. You know, the, you know my man Casper, my man D, 
And just imagine, you know, just, hey, you know, we go, hey, man, we finna go to uh, school. Come on. And you ain't even knowing what the homies is on. Yeah. You know, we rolling the homie, got his rag in his pocket. You know, fuck it. We, it is what it is. Yeah. And then you run into the opposition. Mm. So this is at eight. Yeah, this is eighth grade. Yeah. So imagine running into the opposition and the opposition pulling up. And i never forget it, man, so vividly, man. You know, we barely get cross bullets, and it's a Louis Burgers right there. Mm-hmm. So if you've ever been to Con- mm-hmm. you know, world-famous Louis Burgers, yeah, you know, you got to go get the motherfucking chili chips fries. <laughs> Anybody know about that? But um, we getting over there in front of Louis Burgers, and the, this is one of the first experiences, man. I mean, bam. Next thing you know, you see 20 different dudes coming across the street, and they banging on the homies. And so the homies... He banging full fledged, and from there, just imagine getting your ass whooped. Draws kick clean up your ass. You running for dear life, like goddamn, <laughs> them niggas on our ass. Yeah, you get to school, you got knots and shit in your curl. Yeah, you know, ass. Whooped. You had the curl back then. Oh yeah, what? Yeah. Which one? You I had think I had a Hawaiian free? silky, nigga. A Hawaiian silky. Hawaiian silky. Okay. Any anybody? They had, I know they had luster silk. Luster Air silk. Free. Yeah, no, nah, none of that bullshit. Okay. <laughs> nigga, the original Hawaiian silky. If any of y'all out there know, somebody out there know Hawaiian silky with the little pink flower on it. Yeah, so uh, I yeah. know about that. One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that California shit. Oh yeah, yeah. Cause we just had Carefree and Luster uh-huh. Silk. You right, know right, right. This was like a little small company or whatever, not, uh-huh. but they made bomb ass curls. Okay. And so I'll never forget. I saved up my bread and got me a Hawaiian silky. <laughs> oh man, I was whipped. Yep, I was. Did man. your shit had a hang time? Oh, oh yeah, man. You know, I, I got a good grade of hair, so yeah, just yeah. imagine. You know, my curl, you know, bam, you know, I, I had a full blown curl, fat chubby nigga, you, you know. You had your soul glowing. Oh, glowing. <laughs> what? Man, what? Man, no question. So, yeah, I mean, and from that day on, I realized how real it was. You know, you get to licking your wounds mm-hmm. and you're like, damn, this shit real. Mm-hmm. And so, you know my, you know my partner. He like, man, fuck that. We can, we ain't finna just keep getting our ass whooped, mm-hmm. you know. But these your partners in the Elms. No, mm-hmm. these are my partners. My two partners from Santana. Santana. Okay. God bless the dead, my nigga Santana. D, and God, you know my nigga Casper. Mm-hmm. And um, we was walking to school, you know. So imagine walking from Long Beach Boulevard. Mm-hmm. Back then, just it's not nothing like now. You could be anybody. You could. You could be a crip wearing all red. You, mm-hmm. you, you could be a blood wearing all blue now. Mm-hmm. But back then, it was a code of ethics. That gang life and that gang culture was real, and niggas took that shit serious. Yeah. And the one thing that I can say is niggas would beat your ass back then. I mean, <laughs> you, you were running to different dudes that really had real handles. So I'm saying, so middle school, I know for mm-hmm. me, that's when the shit kicked up too. Cause, right, right. Because right. we just exact exact same age. So right. I'm going through the same thing right. in Kansas City. Damn. Same shit. Because okay. a lot of niggas from L.A. came to Kansas City. Right. They brought the work and they brought the, the gang understanding. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? But um, so once you do it, what was the craziest thing that you witnessed? Like, you know what I mean? Like now you from Mississippi, you in this shit. And like you said, it's a culture shock. Like what right. was the, you know, the first time you seen like it really go down. Yeah. Like, oh shit. I mean, it different. just I mean, from that ass whooping that day with me and my boys, yeah. you know, this is sixth grade, so seventh grade. So shit, we fought the entire time. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, this at this time, you know, just to gain respect because we you know what they say now? We the ops. Mm-hmm. You know back yeah. then, yeah. back then we was the ops. Yeah, right. So imagine you going to a school, everybody pretty much p funk, mm-hmm. and we had to. Mm-hmm. It's you know it's maybe about a good handful of dudes up there, six seven, that's yeah. Crips, and yeah. you know, you know you gotta. Mm-hmm. It's it's a respect level because this is a all pot rule school. Yeah. So, but over a period of time of fighting niggas, it was never like. Back then, you know, it wasn't no go get a gun and just shoot a nigga or just lay him down. Back then, niggas would really get down with you. And a lot of them dudes I got down with. Mm -hmm. And when I won a bunch, I lost a bunch. I come with it, bro. Wait a minute. I ain't finna sit here and put it Because these niggas, they get on these shows and put all of this. Yeah, they'll put these heroics on it. No, no, nigga. Don't put that heroic shit out there. Nigga, it's a nigga who... Yeah. Who got what you looking for, nigga? Absolutely. He gonna give you what you looking Absolutely. for. Absolutely. He gonna yeah. give. I don't give a fuck how big you is, how strong you is. Yep. 
It's somebody who gonna give you what you looking for. Every tough nigga I know from the neighborhood, they used to scrap a lot. They'll tell you they 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 won some, but they took some too. Yeah. That come with it. That come, that come with, with it. it. So over a period of time, mm -hmm. it's a lot of them dudes gained the respect for myself and my boy Rest in Peace and my boy Casper. Mm -hmm. Because we kids still. So when they shoot dice, we pull up to the dice game too. Fuck it. Mm -hmm. All right, if it's a disagreement, we step on the side of behind the little behind the cafeteria and get down. Yeah. But it just took a period of time and a lot of them dudes over the years, they knew me from as a little kid. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So the difference of it is 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 in that time, whenever, you know, my mother ended up moving from Tamarant, from Elm and Ponsetia to the third spot we moved to in Compton, you know, which was Compton and Aramby Boulevard. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, when we moved into the Palmers, that's that's it was real in the Palmers. Mm -hmm. uh, How old were you in high school at that time? I was that was my freshman year. I, mm. I ain't good with numbers, man. Yeah. But this is my freshman year. This is ninth grade. So so let, so let me ask you. Um, I mean, you surrounded by all this gang activity. We right. know what that is. Right. What did what did GB a uh, young GB want to be? Like, what what was your aspirations as a kid? I mean, I never forget. Going back to Whaley, mm -hmm. um, I was playing trombone. Really? I know how to play trombone. I know how to play trumpet. A lot of people don't know this. You can I, read music or you play it by ear? I play it by ear. I learned how to read it originally, mm -hmm. but I would hear songs like, you know, Ice, Ice, Baby. Yeah. But this is, you know what era yeah, this yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, We the same so, age. So exactly. exactly. So yeah. in this era, I'm playing, and so my, you know, I was always first chair mm -hmm. in trombone class mm -hmm. six seven eight you know people don't know this i knew how to play trombone wow so i never realized that i had an inclination for music like mm -hmm. that and that it was just something that was coherently just for me yeah i never believed that i always would tear up radios and mm -hmm. I, you know i take my you know my step pops had all of these damn records I used to do the same shit. i used bro. to take all this nigga records man yeah. Yeah. but that's when i first heard brenton wood yeah bobby womack yeah hell melvin in the blue yeah. and i'm scratching them up in his same head. shit oh, confunction to yeah, earth wind and fire oh my yeah. god Cameo. Yeah. 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 yeah and so you know i'm a little i'm a youngster so uh -huh. By the time I'm getting older and I'm going into high school, this is hip hop is at its this is its golden era. Yeah, you know a lot of you. What was the first hip hop record you heard? You know that go way back. I need love, LL Cool J. Really? Oh, uh, I, no, I even heard you know go back to DM. You know, yeah, Run DMC, Run DMC. Yeah, you know, Walk This Way, yeah. all of that. You know, so what was the first? What was the first hip hop record that you heard that planted that seed that you thought you might want to do that? You know, you heard it and you mm -hmm. was like, fuck. I want to do that. I got to get Damn, it I, I mean, it's hard, man, because I used to listen to so much. I used to listen to Black Sheep. Mm -hmm. I used to listen to Brand Nubian Leaders. So it was just so but many. See, we, but we Chubb the same Rock. age, bro. Right, right. So I'm talking before that, because you in Compton, so you right. had, you had uh, Toddy T, Tweety Bird, Lowe. Right. You but see, I saying? was different from all of that, because mm -hmm. I've always breathed and ate hip-hop. Okay. Hip-hop. I love West Coast music. Mm -hmm. When niggas was running around here playing Snoop, I love Snoop. But nigga, I had Illmatic. I was uh, playing Wu Tang okay. Clan okay. in Compton. Okay. So when you look at dudes who had, who are from Compton, who have lyrical ability, yeah, yeah, they were listening to hip hop. Yeah, yeah, they were influenced by Rakim. Rakim. Paris, no, 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 not yeah. just Rakim. But yeah. when you first heard Ill, heard Nas, mm -hmm. Illmatic. Imagine, homie, I'm sitting there with a curl listening to a nigga from New York. Yeah. Because like, Illmatic is hard. what, like 92? Yeah. 93, something yeah, like 90, that. So yeah. I can't say per se what song it was mm -hmm. that said that I could do this because, yeah. again, the first time I ever heard music that told me that this was something that, in my nature, yeah. my mother was sitting at a piano, mm -hmm. and this was my mother's hustle. I, I can't be no more than five. My brother, three. I'm... Literally, I'm putting a peppermint in his mouth, and my mama's sitting here on stage in this big church in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And my mama knew how to play organ, and she knew how to play piano. Mm -hmm. But my mama couldn't read no music. That's where you get that talent from. My mama never could read no yeah. music. So i never forget one day, my mama hit a note. But usually, in the, you know, you're a kid and you playing, but this wasn't play no more. Mm -hmm. 
it was like it's like a zombie hearing a certain sound and then he snaps out of his zombieism. Mm -hmm. Like she hit a note, I never forget. I was five years old and I looked up at my mama. I had on a, a baby blue little vest, I had my little shoes on, my little, and I looked up at my mama and I looked back at the crowd. And you know they had the Holy Spirit yeah, going. You yeah, know, yeah. Oh dun, yeah, dun, dun, so dun, they dun, own it. Yeah. Dun, dun, they they going. Yeah, yeah, they mama going. going on the organ. <laughs> she on the organ going. Yeah. My mama hair jumping. I'm like, boom. And she hit a note. And so she broke it back down and she did a solo on a slow tip. And I'm sitting there like this. And then I knew, like, that's soul. That's music. Because yeah. it, it resonated with me in a way that when I would hear my mother sing the last time, she always sung. And um, this Mother's Day really, really touched me greatly because she always wanted to go to the studio with me, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, you know, um, it's so crazy, man, because when my son was one, my son is 14, I remember I had this party at my shop, and it's his first birthday, so I'm doing all of this stuff. I done rented, I done probably spent about two, three thousand dollars. And um it's so crazy, Court, because she knew my spirit was down. And she walked up to me, and I'm sitting in my barber shop, I'm sitting in one of the chairs, and I got stylists and barbers around. And she starts singing to me. And I got tears flowing down my face. That's the last time my mama sung to me. You know, and I lost my mama in the pen. Damn, I'm sorry to hear that, brother. But it reminded me of when she sang on that stage that day, mm -hmm. that solo piece. And she blessed me and my brothers with the ability to understand music and love music. Mm -hmm. And I always knew that it was going to be a part of my life because I had this insatiable drive for it. Mm -hmm. The tenacity, the knack, no matter what it was. I mean, I'll never forget. <laughs> I'll be in there with all of these records, but I got a 38 on me. I got a, I got weed in my pocket. Yeah. I'm in here with, you know, love and happiness. Yeah. I'm in here, yeah. do, do, do right. Yeah. I'm in here playing, and, and you know, my step pops, turn that shit off back there. <laughs> I never forget this. My mom in there cooking, but <clears throat> no matter what, it was just my driving. Yeah. I used to have speakers, man. No lie, man. I ain't never told nobody this shit. <laughs> I had speakers, bro, all around the goddamn room, homie. Yeah. Listen to me, homie. It's speakers everywhere. Yeah. And all of this shit hooked up. Mm -hmm. I'm taking shit apart, putting shit together. I got EQs. I just knew that music was something I was supposed to do. It was yeah. inherently something in my spirit. And so by the time... You know, I, I'm in middle school and I'm playing trumpet and I'm and you know what's so crazy? I watched the homie, my little homie. He played the trumpet. Always was first chair. I'm not knowing. I'm remembering his notes and I'm hearing his notes. Mm -hmm. Man, I must have took the spray and wiped his mouthpiece off. The homie showed me the notes. Man, I get the blast in his trumpet off ear. Mm -hmm. And he like, what? You play the trumpet? Who told you how to play the trumpet? You don't got our music sheets. Mm -hmm. But I ain't got no music sheet. I'm playing it off the of ear. I'm playing yeah. it from the soul. Yeah. I'm playing it from the heart. When I used to ask my mother, right now, so crazy, my niece looks exactly like my mother. She walks up, you know, my brother, you know, hot, you know, he has mm -hmm. a daughter. Her name is Milan. And, I mean, I believe she's going to be one of the most influential female producers to come. Because her ear for music reminds me so much of my mother. It is crazy mm -hmm. because this girl has never read a note in her life, Court. Wow. She be making tracks mm -hmm. that's just mind boggling, yeah. her sampling ability. And so, you know, she'll just walk up to the piano, looking around, just like my mama, playing notes. Yeah. But my mom used to sing, but she just be playing notes. How old is she? She's 14. Okay, yeah. And she's dope. And so I knew then that I was going to always be a part of music. I was just caught up in life Let me ask you life this. I want to well. lean into that a little bit, like mm -hmm. what you said about losing your mother, because I lost mine, too, in 2010. Right, you right. You know what I'm saying? And I'm an only child, so, you know. <sighs> yeah. And it's nothing like a mother's love. Like I always say, no matter, you know, how much money we get, no matter how tough we is, no matter how successful we get, 
you know, you always want to feel like you're somebody's baby. You know right, I mean? exactly. So, like, how did that affect you, especially being locked up? Because, I mean, shit, it devastated me, you know Man. what I mean? Like, I had to deal with depression and all kind of shit. It took me years to come up out of that, you know what I'm saying? But I was really fucked up, homie. I can imagine. I was I fucked imagine. up, homie. How did you deal with that? Listen, homie, <clears throat> I couldn't really even, I didn't even know how to deal with it. Mm-hmm. I never forget, I came back from the gym. And you know, I'd be on some prison workout shit, you mm-hmm. know. On the bar work? You no, know, not like that. I do jump on the stair stepper, drop to the floor, do 20 push ups, do 10 curls, okay. get back on for a minute, that type of shit. So I yeah. come back, I'm soaking wet. <laughs> I'm getting ready to get ready to, you know, jump in the shower, jump in the shower. I come out. And uh, the chaplain walk in. Chaplain, white man with this big beard. But he's so cool and peaceful, man. But you know when he come, he like the Grim Reaper. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting here and I'm reading my book. I got my foot up in the chair. And I'm expecting him to keep walking. He walked right to my bunk. I already knew. Mm-hmm. I already knew. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, damn, homie. Yeah, homie. <clears throat> so um, he like, uh, Mr. Williamson, uh, you Mr. Williamson, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You bunks three, six lower? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> He like, uh, come walk with me over here. Come over here and walk with me to the chapel. So, you know, Harry O, yeah. he see me outside. Hey, black, everything all right? I put my head down, <clears throat> walk past Harry O. He walked me over to the chaplain. He said, um, I have some news for you, Mr. Williamson. You know, your mother has passed, but um, if you want, you know, we can make a phone call to your brother. Your brother, he called up here to let us know that she passed away. He's just real soft-spoken dude, mm-hmm. man. Just real, real cool and humble. What year was this? This is 18. Okay. November. Damn, that's fresh, bro. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, um, man, I, I'm just, I'm so this, really trying to keep my brothers calm. Yeah. Because they're having to deal with all of that with her. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, my oldest brother, we moved her back to Mississippi. Mm-hmm. And her wishes was to be buried with her mother and her father, mm-hmm. uh, my grandparents. Mm-hmm. Did they let you out for the funeral, for the services? They wanted to let me out, but it would have cost almost $10,000 a day. Damn. And imagine court yeah. being in an orange jumpsuit yeah. with federal agents. or Well, you know, to transport you would be the U.S. Marshals. Absolutely. You know, yeah. people don't know that the U.S. Marshals is outside contracted by the FBOP to move Inmates. We had to do the same thing with C murder when it, when his grandmother when their grandmother passed. We had to go through the same shit for C murder. To go. Yeah, homie, yeah, and, and I, they ate the same thing. They had him in. Yeah, the I can't. I ain't want to be seeing my mama like yeah. that, homie. Yeah. Imagine my mama, her all her family members there, and her baby in cuffs and in chains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paying Damn, respects that's, like that's that. That's fresh, bro. Like Paying three years. Respects like that. I can't do it. I couldn't do it like yeah. that, homie. Yeah, three years is fresh, bro. You know, yeah. my heart goes out to you because it's eleven for me, bro, and it's yeah. still. Like, you know, 11 years, I kind of keep it in the back, you know what I'm saying? But it's right there. It's always right there. But the one thing that I can accredit, you know, at the time my name came up for this drug program. But I had only accounted it for it being a drug program or Mm -hmm. whatever not. And um, some of y'all who've been in the BOP, I know some of y'all out there listening, y'all been in the BOP. It's called RDAP. Um, I signed out. Um, so I'm just going through it on my own mm-hmm. by myself and people, you know, you know, we raised in the streets, right? We keep shit close to the chest. Yeah. You suppress it. We, we suppress that shit, homie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because this is the way the streets taught us mm-hmm. not to show fear, not to, not show, to, show, not weakness, to show weakness, not to show nothing. Yeah. Nigga, you hold that shit in, nigga. You man up, nigga. But what if a lot of the ways we were taught to deal with things were, not the way we're supposed to deal with things. Mm-hmm. So I gave this program a try, and I was able to have skilled help around me. And when I say skilled help, psychiatrists, people to talk to me about my past, you know, your, my conditionings, my cognitions, the mm-hmm. choices that I've made. And, you know, when I say conditions, the environment in which I was raised in. Absolutely. Um, my cognition, the way that my environment made me begin to think yes absolutely. and then after the way i begin to think the choices that i would make over the periods of my life you know me hustling and me 
being in the streets and me banging and all of these different things and mm -hmm. to this nature, it made me weigh it out. I'm not saying that it was just a come to Jesus moment, but it put me in a different space to where I could think about what I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. I could step back from myself and I could have a filter enough to where I could put these thoughts in my mind, but I also have these thoughts in my mind. It may not change exactly the way that I feel, mm -hmm. but I could lessen the degree and the intensity of it. And so me being in a place where I could talk about, you know, my mom, mm -hmm. you know, this happened, this happened in a safe space. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people out there look at that as taboo or, you know, they wouldn't <clears throat> believe in that. But yeah. yeah, when you have a space on some real shit, on some real shit, when you talk about shit, whether you believe it or not, you telling me about your mother, but whether you know it or not, you processing that with me, like I'm processing this with mm -hmm. you. Even though it's an emotional topic to talk about, and it's been 11 years and it's been three years for me, mm -hmm. you healing from it. Mm -hmm. And I know you like, man, how the fuck this nigga talking about some shit like this? Nigga, this shit done went into this. No, I'm just being no, honest. No, it's all good. That's what this show is about. Exactly. Yeah, real. We, we got to be real with yeah, ourselves yeah. because, you know, you know, we was taught one way to deal with things. Yeah. And, you know, mama say, nigga, you need to be strong. And don't you show them niggas no weakness. If they beat your ass, you take your ass back out there. I'm going to beat your ass. Right. But a lot of things over a period of time, especially for me being inside of a federal penitentiary serving a nine-year, two-month sentence and losing my mama. That's crazy. That shit's starting to. Hell yeah. Start, I'm starting to hear shit and think shit like. Fuck these niggas and fuck everything. Mm -hmm. Fuck everybody. Mm -hmm. And so these thoughts is becoming, I, I'm on a hamster wheel. I'm on a hamster wheel, you know? And so this shit is just spinning. And I got to get, I didn't have no way to get off the wheel. So when it came back up for me to go, you know, I was the head orderly back there in Jadon. And so I told Miss Blair, my counselor, I said, you know what, Miss Blair, I need you to put in the word for me. Go talk to Dr. Caro, Dr. Lipitor and them and let them know, you know, I need to uh I need to try that program. I need to get out of jail. I'm tired. Yeah. I'm tired. I had made up in my mind I'm tired. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been here seven years, Miss Miss Blair. I'm ready to go home. Yeah. I, I I lost my mama in here, you know, my kids everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, me and my wife, we estranged. Yeah. I need, I need to, you know, so I, I'm i thinking I'm doing this. I'm on some slick shit, nigga. I'm finna yeah. get out of jail. I'm finna right. play the system. Right, right, right. But in me thinking that I was playing the system, the system was like, mm -hmm. whoa, oh, this shit just got real. Mm -hmm. This shit got real, real. Like, wait a minute. Oh, nigga, that bed need to be made this way. This accountability. See, people don't change because, you know, <laughs> they see the light. Mm -hmm. Niggas change because they feel the heat. Yeah, because they, they put get the caught. Heat, yeah, yeah, they yeah. Put the heat up under their ass. Like, <laughs> yeah. no, 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 we're not doing that. Yeah, what, what they do? They do that out there. They don't do that in here. You trying to go home, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got, you got to do. So this, you this think way. that being locked up, you learn some structure and some some discipline? Oh, even more. Yeah, I became segmented and regimented. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, you know, and you know how it is. in prison, homie, it, you not finna go in there and buck the system. Right. Prison is already set up the way that it's set up. When you walk your ass up in there, you you think you the biggest thing that ever touched down. And no, nigga. Mm -hmm. When you get in there, you got niggas in there that did 15, 20 years. Right. <laughs> they were still they was doing this shit while you were shitting yellow. Right. You, you know? got some niggas in there never going home. Exactly, homie. I used yeah. to see niggas paperwork say deceased on it. Shit. You see the nigga smiling, homie. You see all his front teeth. Yeah. Old nigga pulled up on me. I said, damn, that nigga real happy, man. You know, he got deceased all the time. No, nigga, he ain't smiling. He's showing you his fangs, nigga. <laughs> Play with it if you want to. Yeah. He's showing you his fangs. Yeah. I said, damn. Yeah, because a nigga got life. What incentive does he have to change? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's his environment. That's nigga, what this is be. my home, nigga. That's his home. <laughs> when they bring me up out of here and I go see the maker, nigga, I'm going out of bag out of here, nigga. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Stay safe. <laughs> stay, Real talk. Stay, stay safe. Real talk. So when you understand the gravity mm -hmm. of those situations, it make you appreciate everything so much, much more. Mm -hmm. A lot of people haven't been put in positions or situations and where their liberty's been taken. Right. When you do, you understand what the fuck is going on. Absolutely. Very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. And this is an environment that it takes a while to get your mind from the streets. Mm -hmm. But these dudes been in here the last two and three decades. Mm -hmm. 
So they've been living their lives in a bubble. That's all it's they like, know. It's like it's like this big ass table, and you pushing this phone in the middle of that table, and they all living on that little phone. The world mm-hmm. is so big, but they living on here. Yeah. And it's only them every day, all day. They mad as fuck. They miserable as fuck. Mm. They had bad phone calls with their girls. Their kids acting up. They got no way. They have no control. Right. They have no life other than what's here. Right. They're no more to their families than a voice. Mm-hmm. It's the next thing being, next thing to death. So I want to dial it back because we definitely going to get to your time in prison. So before all of that, right, so when did you start making, so you wanted to ultimately play the trombone. You wanted to be a I musician. I like trombone. I didn't, you wanted I didn't to be want a to be a musician. So I I'm just, saying, what did you want to do, though? You know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Okay. Um, I'll never forget, you know, back then, man, I, I had a Camaro, and this is ninth grade at Compton High, and my boy Tukey, Darrell, and all of us, well, you know. You was doing it if you was driving a Camaro. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was getting me some you bread. I, I was getting some bread. <laughs> I mean, what year? What year, Camaro? This, this is... <laughs> It's got to be like 93, 94. Y'all get me with these years. I, I can't remember. I'm, I'm getting old, man. My shit was, is, if you was driving. I, was, I had a Camaro. Great, my, my, first was, car, yeah. my first car was a 5.0. I'll never forget. I used to go oh, up to Alameda. Right. Had a, and it's I, a I, yeah. It was a salvage <laughs> one. I had got, you know, had a, I had Amigo go bondo the shit up out of it, paint it all up for me. <laughs> I went and stole me some rims, some 17s, yeah. some triple goals. You know what them is if you're from that era. Yeah. Some triple was goals. They, was they Dayton's or you had to play Oh, yeah. They was Dayton's, man. Okay. Keep it 100 because they was player wheels in LA. No, 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 no. There wasn't no laces, nigga. Okay. Let's not get this shit confused. Okay. I know what I went for. And I, I, yeah. Oh, I used to go do, you know, back yeah. then I used to go, you know, I see your shit out there, nigga. I go hit oh, your shit sure. with a kaplooey. Yeah. Blow that and window your, open. And your shit I knock, be on bricks when yeah, you Yeah, I leave out. that shit on bricks. So yeah. I'm going to go take your, yeah. I'm going to take your stereo. I'm going to take everything up out of it. Yeah. That's what me and my brothers. Dayton's was the easiest shit to get off. What I mean, it was a Dayton mallet. You what know what I'm saying? It? Yeah, the adapters ain't shit. You know Man, no question. <laughs> so we used to, that's what, you know, I put the Dayton's on there. I'm fresh. I got my cr And you know, you know, I nobody gave me the alert, nigga. You couldn't wear a curl. This is ninth grade. I pull up with a full blown curl. Look at look at niggas like, wait a minute. Um, you didn't get the text message. <laughs> it was, you didn't get the message. No curls. Nigga. Right, right. We got curly tops now. Got curly tops. We're like, in the hot top. Yeah, curly, yeah, we yeah, got the curly yeah, yeah, tops. So yeah. I'm like, I pull up with the full blown. I'm out there shining. <laughs> the niggas look like got armor on. Boy, I, I bet all the bitches was on you. Oh. Five point oh. Hey, and man, night. hey, listen, man. You know what, man? You know what? I was a big teddy bear, yeah. baby. I was a big teddy bear. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you know, nigga, my first car was a. I had a Cadillac photo, um, brome. Right. Uh, I bought it for like five hundred dollars. Right. And I didn't even get the title to that bitch. Yeah. And see, I bought a, a Cutlass, but my first shit, my my first low rider. Was I got a blue cutlass with some chrome datings? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Hunter spoke, not the 72. Ooh. You know what I'm saying? And I had the blue spokes on my shit. Oh, shit. You know oh, what I'm saying? Shit. 10 switches. Right. You know what I mean? All that shit. I had all that shit. I so, was in so y'all had the LA, y'all had the LA car culture too? Yeah. In KC? Yeah. yeah see, man. Nor- NorCal was different because we was hyper, like, we had old school. Yeah, y'all, y'all, y'all always North Cal always have been some trendy dudes that always had seven fly Chevelles. shit. Yeah, y'all always been on Chevelles, rally rims, yeah, Anteras. Always, remember the all, Anteras? Yeah, 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 yeah. Y'all had that shit yeah, up there. Yeah, yeah. You know, my um, first car was a nineteen eighty Camaro. I went old. Eighty Camaro. Nineteen eighty. But we, I had a we I had a seventy seven Camaro. The eighty that, had the bubble lights when they switched. I bought it for seven hundred dollars on occasion. Yeah, right in front of Compton High, yeah. <laughs> Mexican had it for sale. It had all it had burgundy interior. It was all white. Yeah. It was seven hundred dollars. Somebody had the shoe polish seven hundred on it. <laughs> I went straight back to the crib. Went right up under that mattress. So oh, the mattress <laughs> counted that out. Went over there. Yeah. Amigo, hey, what's going hey, on? Here? That's how you got to get down. Yeah. yeah, I want to buy. Yeah, I got that bag right now for you. Yeah, were well, you in seven hundred? No, I ain't got seven hundred now. Yeah, what do you, what do you got? What you get it for? I got six fifty. <laughs> you know, I gave him six fifty. I, I gave my last six fifty. Yeah. I kept fifty for a double up. You know yeah, what I'm saying? they so, said for a double up. So, uh, shit. But um, I bought it. You know what I mean? I ain't put no rims on it, but because I wrecked the five point I had, I had a mask in named Armando, and so. When I bought it, I bought it salvage. Mm-hmm. But man, the Mexican shot it right there in his driveway. He put the little tin up. Mm-hmm. He shot my shit jet black, mm-hmm. bondoed it all up, fixed it all up. My yeah. interior wasn't just mm-hmm. like fire. Like, yeah, yeah. Let's not put, I ain't finna put, yeah, yeah. you know, put you wasn't all the way there, but put tins on okay. tubes on me. Yeah, I ain't yeah. finna put it out there like it yeah. was like, 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 like that. Yeah. yeah. But my shit looked good on the outside. On the outside. Nigga. Yeah, yeah. You, know, <laughs> my shit was, if you go inside, nigga, that look like a trap. <laughs> man, we used to go, we used to go to Craig in. And they had this shit you could spray on the carpet just as like because the carpet's yeah. all fucked up. <laughs> we just painted it black. Yep. We just painted it all black. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's how we did it. Whooped. But 
He pay, he hooked my shit up. He fixed it, put the bar dough on there. He painted my shit. Yeah. I'm like, okay, it was a hard top. Man, I'll never forget. Back then, it was the Ramada. Mm-hmm. Everybody know where the Ramada at in Compton. It was a little, they had a little thing up there, a little dance up there. We Man, we young. I'm coming back. My brother, he on the right side. We coming down Compton Boulevard and hit Wilmington. Mm-hmm. Not Wilmington. Yeah, Wilmington. Man, a nigga, man, come out of nowhere. He run the light, blow the light, blast my shit. It's like we in slow motion. All you hear is glass blowing, glass, mm-hmm. everything in slow motion. Man, he tore my shit up, Dang. tore my whole car up. So I, I was on I was on Patton Turner back then. You know, yeah. if y'all youngsters out there listening to Patton Turner, nigga, that was your left foot, your right foot. <laughs> <laughs> I was on Patton Turner. You know what I'm saying? So uh, check it up. Yeah, I was back on Patton Turner, yeah. so... You know, we, so we we young, so I get straight back to the grind. You yeah. know, I, I I hit the homie. So you in high school at this point? You grinding, you mm-hmm. trapping, mm-hmm. doing your thing, nigga. You driving a five point oh. You know, what not I'm very saying? long. Not nigga, very I, long. I'm still, I'm hating, nigga. I wanted one of them motherfuckers, especially when we see men inside. You said, know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's what you know everything. What I mean? I'm hating, was. nigga. I had a cut list. You know right, what I mean? Right, but right. but um, so now, so when do you? So you you graduated high school? No, I didn't graduate high okay. school. Okay. So you, so what you do? You just, you just said fuck it. You was full. By the tenth grade, man. By the tenth grade, I was like fuck high school. Yeah. You know, it was, you know, man. So you went full fledged in the street. I went full fledged into the street, man. And so, um, weed was my introduction. So Mm -hmm. I started getting weed, and Mm -hmm. I'm flipping weed. But the weed, yeah, yeah, that's some Reggie. Looking around for Reggie, me and my boys, we we selling and we buying a quarter pound, and then we buy us a half pound. I remember them days. And so I'm like, (laughs) oh, this is not really productive. It's you know, nigga got to save every dollar. Because what was it out here? Was about what four fifty a pound, maybe something like that, five hundred. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. you could get it for about five hundred back then in the gap, about five hundred. If you was buying a few of them, you can get them for cheaper. Yeah, yeah. We had that man that compressed bullshit yep. running around there, you know, that nigga. Headache. Man, what? <laughs> Full of seeds and sticks and seeds. shit. You smoking that shit, that shit be but popping. We and fucking shit. kids, yeah. man. And so I never forget the shit, you know. You know, the essay was like, oh, you need Pieta. Pieta? You like Pieta? Like, yeah, what? what? Oh, mm-hmm. okay. He gave me a motherfucking double up hundo. Shh. I'm like, man, so I, you know, I get home, you know, yeah. I, I bring, get in my bread, like, yeah. here, y'all keep that. Yeah. And so, y'all, y'all good. Yeah. So, you know, the plug, he just ended up, it went from that. I'm like, oh, I moved the double up hundo that same night. So I done gave him his bag back. I got my bag. I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, it's okay. Uh, he gave me double that. I go back, I flip it. Mm-hmm. I'm like, wait a minute. I got me, I got about five, six hundred dollars now. Mm-hmm. Fuck the weed. The weed is there. Yeah. So he know I still like to move the weed though. Mm-hmm. And so he like, this my I never forget. He, he from San Catecas. He take me in there. He had a number of birds and shit everywhere. He, <laughs> man, listen. The man was a fanatic over the birds. Yeah, a I got fanatic, a story like that too. A fanatic. Sure. Listen, the man be kissing the birds' head and <laughs> rubbing them. And, oh my baby, oh my baby. Yeah, yeah. Man, the man had you know one of them ponchos. Uh-huh. Man, roll back the poncho. Man, he got. A, I'm thinking he got a balo. Hey, mm-hmm. man, the man had a whole balo of weed. Mm-hmm. Oh, pff, it's multi. It's nothing. You want it here? Here, give me three hundred. I give you one. He broke it off, pulled it off, made the whole pee, put it on a damn big ass scale because he weighed the birds on the yeah. same scale. He put the whole pound on. Boom, give it to me. <laughs> For 300. Yeah. The homies pull up. I get him the whole pee. Here. Yeah. What you want back? Man, shit. Y'all niggas give me 600. Yeah. The homies like, what? You want six? Man, the homies was like, Psh, run it. Man, the homies, man, they got the weed moving everywhere, but I'm still. I done gave them one. He front me one, mm-hmm. and I'm he giving me a double up. So, I never forget I hit my other, you know, he was having the shit so fire. Oh my God, this nigga had some fire ass work. And so my boy, you know, everybody know how to, you know, you know how to, I don't know if you fucked around, but you you do know how to cook. I cook. The cook game. Yeah, yeah I know how to yeah, cook. Yeah. But I back then. Some people have uh, yes, uh, the yeah, talent. Yeah, some you know niggas have I mean? talent. But yeah, yeah. This nigga had a talent. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't just talented. This nigga was gifted. Yeah. <laughs> this nigga had a gift because I'm talented when it comes to cooking. Yeah. But this nigga had a gift. <laughs> that type of work, homie, 
my nigga, that type of work that was so fire, when you take you the work. You knew it was going to come back. No, homie. I yeah. would sit down with a double up. Well, a quarter piece. Mm -hmm. I take back then a quarter piece. Be for me is twelve and a half, thirteen grams. Mm -hmm. Homie, I chopped that up, boom, and I I could take a nice dub and throw it and hit that brick wall, hit that brick right there. I don't know if that's real brick. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know what that is, but yeah, hit that and the shit bounce all around, homie, and it'll still be the same. It could be so hard. Yeah, man, the smokers come back, man. They got rescue rooters in their pipe. They still working on it. <laughs> Youngster, that's some fire you got, youngster. <laughs> Man, they working on a the pipe. They still hitting because yeah. it's still in there. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what he would do, homie. He gave you that good peru. Homie, man. he would never. The shit was pure. Listen, that you was but he, it's one thing to have some good work mm -hmm. and then to have a gifted nigga who can cook. Yeah. When you add the two, yeah. my nigga, this is phenomenal. Yeah. So this shit right here, this shit right here, <laughs> oh, my God, homie. So it was so fire. Once I got my bag up, mm -hmm. you know, I hit, you know, the boy up like, yeah, give me a nine pack. Mm -hmm. So I go take, I get a homie, he'll bring it back for me. When he bring it back, I give him one. Mm -hmm. But I'm only giving him half mm -hmm. of the nine. So half of that, it come back damn near shit. He take four and turn four to damn near six and a half, seven. So you skipped going and getting a four and a half. You went right to a nine. Yeah, hell, fuck it. Why yeah. would I buy a four when yeah. I got the bag? My right. bag was up. He's right. still giving me double up. So all I'm doing, all he asking for is his bread. Yeah. So when he giving me the nine, I'm letting the homie put it together. <laughs> and all I'm doing is just. Yeah. <laughs> sell yeah. one for him. Uh-huh. Sell one for me. Yeah. Sell one for him. Mm -hmm. Sell one for. So I never fucked his money up because it was his spot. Right. So he was still getting his money, yeah. but I'm getting my money. And he ain't tripping as long as he eating. And see, the thing about it, I want to touch on that because our generation was taught different. See, one thing my OGs taught me, as long as you keep telling the plug here and give him his money, he going to keep saying here. Exactly. See, now they got this whole thing run off on the plug. Like, Oh, no, 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 no. You don't do that. No, that's, homie, you don't. Listen, you know listen. Saying? Especially no. when you're fucking with the Pisces listen, or something like that. I can, listen, I can still pull up on him to this day. That's how close I am with him. good, yeah. Listen. Face card good. I seen his son, homie, from this. Mm-hmm. His son up to this now. Mm -hmm. Full grown man, facial hairs. Mm -hmm. His daughters, all of them. And the beautiful thing of it is, is, is that that's like fam, homie. Right. If I can eat with you, I can shit with you, you my family. Right. You understand what I'm saying? These young niggas run off on the plug, you run off on the plug, you mm -hmm. run off on your money. Man, you listen, dumb ass nigga. You you See, you could you ran off on the nigga for a hundred bands, you could have made a, a ten million with ten that. Ten million nigga. with the nigga. You know what I'm saying? Listen, <laughs> niggas like when you got a plug, a plug. You run off on the plug. What? Mm -hmm. You finna go buy what these young niggas go buy them big ass shoes now? Yeah. Big ass shoes look like space boots on. Yeah, but then see yeah, shit. Yeah. yeah. You go buy this shit, you in the club, you done popped you a few bottles. Now the yeah. bag done you done bust the bag. The yep. bag is ran through. Right. It, I mean, this motherfucker raggedy. Yep. Now you standing here, you look around. You ain't around, got no work. You got a nigga on your ass. You ain't got no ass, money to no even money, go cop. No nothing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. For short sighted. What? For a hundred bands? Yep. For a hundred? For a hundred. Listen, homie. When you could have made, like you just said, ten million easily, easily, then your name good, your name, your name good. That's the most important. Your thing name right good, yeah. your name good in these streets. Mm -hmm. You ain't got a nigga on your ass getting ready to knock your motherfucking mind out. Mm -hmm. Nigga playing with you, kill your mama, nigga. Especially you fucking, like I said, you fucking with the cartel or the Pisces or something like that, boy. They gonna come get everybody. They funny. exactly. So you don't play. I learned. I say loyalty before love because you can't have love unless there's loyalty. Right. And so in that understanding of that, this man didn't even have to turn me on. Mm -hmm. This nigga seen me continuously buying quarter pounds. Mm -hmm. Ask me, you know about Pieta? No, not really. You want some Pieta? Mm -hmm. He hit you with the with the Boston George. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> he only yeah. He pushing him. He nice little old chunky Rizzo. Yeah. Oh, the leg place. Oh, I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. Like, oh, gracias. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know. You <clears throat> see, you know, in this day and age, all you know, you, you know, you, in this day and age, you always see the inside of a nigga hand. You never right. see the other side of his hand. Right. What does that mean? He always got his motherfucking hand out. Right. 
Right. What does that mean? You never see the dark side of his hand. You always see the light sketch side of the nigga. <laughs> yeah, hand. yeah. No, nigga. You know, it, this shit has to be reciprocated. Yeah, reciprocation. Hey, it's funny, like you saying when you dealing with the Brown brothers. I used to go to El Paso back in the day, way back in the day. You know right, what I'm right. Before I was doing what you know, um, and I used to go down there. To, you know, the pounds was like two hundred and twenty five dollars. Right, right, no right. bullshit. You right, know right, what I'm right. And I remember I would go down there, bro, and. The the Mexicans down there they were super cool, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't know what mayate meant mm -hmm, until yeah. they was talking to my dude, and I'd be like, "Man, why they keep saying mayate?" <laughs> he he was black and Mexican mixed, right? Right. He right. was like, "Yeah, man, they like you, but they calling you a nigga though." You know yeah, what I'm saying? You're a nigga. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, the they would try to give me work, like right. the, for whatever reason. I mean, I I remember going into a house and it was just boxes stacked to the ceiling, right? Right. I thought it was my weed because, you know, at that time, I'm getting two, three hundred pounds. You know right, what right, I mean? right, 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 right. So they like, you know what I mean? No, we're waiting on a car to come through the uh, the checkpoint, you know, from Juarez, right? Right. It was like, no, take this. Just take right. these. Right, right. Motherfucker right, right. was trying to give me a box of bricks, like, right, right, just because right. my yeah. name was good. Your my name was good. was good. Listen, you know they already, they, they seen that you seen the bigger picture. Yeah. You now, for seen, the record, I didn't take the shit. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't my lane, but yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know. But see, everybody got a lane. You got to <laughs> yeah. learn how to stay in your yeah. lane. Yeah, because I told the nigga, I said, "Look, man, I'm gonna be. I don't sell this shit. I'm yeah. gonna be all year trying to move." You know, this how shit. The, and then you know how the Mexicans is. Yeah. They once you take it, yeah, it's yours. You responsible for that. You responsible. You responsible for that, for that shit. You just took this, <laughs> right? You know when you take this bag, what comes with this exactly. bag? Exactly. You know what comes with exactly. this. Exactly. But they ain't gonna say it here. Oh well. <laughs> but nigga, you know you. Just and that's what they signed. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what they was trying. They would always take this, take the yay. We'll have your shit. We'll have your weed when you come back. But take this. I'm like, dog, I don't no, want no, that no, shit. No, 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 no. I don't want that no, shit. No, no. And you talking about this was what? This was in the late '90s. So you talking about twelve five or something like that? Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know. Yeah. And you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Listen, <laughs> right. Listen, so listen. Uh, yeah, but uh, listen. so I digressed a bit. Yeah. So anyway, so you, so you, you didn't hop off the porch. You get into the bunny. You get into the bag. Right, right, right. right. So you get money in the street. So I'm trying to figure out where the music, where you, when did you start being an artist? When did Gorilla Black form? Was that your first rap name or what? Yeah, you know, I mean, I always was, I always was freestyling. Mm -hmm. So just imagine just freestyling this shit. You know what I mean? Just, so when me and my boys, we'd be sitting around and we'd be, you know, rolling up and, we just freestyle it. And I realized that I could freestyle. Mm -hmm. And that my freestyle ability was there. And I'm like, oh shit. So then I started, you know, mm -hmm. this is, you know, we'll roll up. I go around the corner because I lead a, lead a little spot, go over there, smoke, <clears throat> drink, mm -hmm. freestyle, freestyle, be freestyling and shit. And in the midst of this, I'm hearing and influenced by all of this music at this time, mm -hmm. you know. Just imagine back then, that was the first uh, Cuban links. Yeah. I remember hearing Ghostface. Uh, Raekwon. Raekwon and yeah. Ghostface. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, imagine around this time, 95, I want to mm -hmm. say, Jay-Z drops Reasonable Doubt. Yep. Imagine then at this time, the West Coast is at this level in the game you got yeah, at the you peak. got you got <clears throat> dog pound album you got snoop you got yep. snoop dropping a set album you know what i'm saying you got you all got, of these you got monsters. warren g warren g yeah. you got all of this so i'm in the middle of this whole hodgepodge of different musical influences mm -hmm. because i've always loved hip-hop mm -hmm. you know I've always been a hip hop fan. I love Chub Rock. Chub Rock. Yeah. What was, what was his uh treat him like a what was it? Treat, treat them right. right. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. No. So I mean Yeah, the nigga moved big he moved good for a big nigga. Oh too. man, but the nigga was smooth with his shit <laughs> yeah. and the nigga had a lyrical ability. Yeah, to be Chub able Rock to was just dope. Play with his words and shit. Yeah. So um just imagine at that time I'm being influenced by all of this. So I'm freestyle. Man, I, me and the homie smoke smokers three or four blunts and I'm rhyming and I'm rhyming. Mm -hmm. And Around this time, I ended up, my mother, she was traveling there, and she was doing um, reception, you know, not reception, but a telemarketing spot. Mm -hmm. So I had to be no more than about maybe 14, 15 years old around this time. And so I ended up, you know, meeting um, my man, Big Rich. Mm -hmm. And so Big Rich introduced me 
to around at this time Ice T and Ice T has a company called Corner Records. Yeah. And Ice salute T Salute to the homie Ice T. I just talked to him. Salute to the ago. homie, man. I just talked to him. Because homie, that <clears throat> day I went to the studio, I thought it was a game. Mm-hmm. Man, the homie, homie, he ain't put no cut on it. He got at me raw. Mm-hmm. But I could have been bitter in him checking me on shit. What did he, he check you on? Was it because was it I didn't know? Or? No, he checked me because I didn't know my shit. Mm-hmm. In terms like, of what? Like, Ice is the type he want you to remember your flow. Okay, okay. You know, you these new dudes they re, you read it on the phone yeah, and all yeah. of that. And even me, yeah. if he see me reading a piece of paper right now, he would be on my ass when yeah. I go in the studio. But I have the ability now. I've been doing my craft for so yeah. long right, right. that I could read a rap off of the paper and it sounds just like I know it by heart. But I've been doing this so long, so. I'm acquainted very, very well with myself, but mm-hmm. imagine I'm young and I'm in there and I'm doing take after take, and he take me to his house. This mm-hmm. nigga don't take me no bullshit. Mm-hmm. This nigga got a motherfucking state of the art studio in his house with, with a Shark Tank. For sure, that's the one in Hollywood Hills. Yeah, yeah, yeah what? Yeah. yeah, man, no question, homie. The homie rolled out the the, the the carpet for me. You know what I mean? So he take me in there and he was like, "You need to know your shit." Nigga, I need to feel this shit. Mm -hmm. I need you to be riding this motherfucking beat. You need to be in pocket. Your voice supposed to be cutting through these tracks. Your shit supposed to be undeniably smoking, nigga. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sitting there like this. Wow. Because this nigga just gaming me up. I'm like, I'm a young nigga in the star somewhere. I'm seeing the light. (laughs) Nigga, I'm getting in the... But he he getting at me hard. Yeah. But homie, every time I would see him... You know, Ice always be busy. You know, Ice, you know, it was so much shit going on. But he always pulled me to the side. Hey, nigga, come in here. And get and he would talk to me and mentor me mm-hmm. and let me see and talk to me about the history of this shit. Mm-hmm. Because Ice is the history of the West Coast. Absolutely. He is the first gangster shit yep. on the West Coast. I don't care what nobody say. You could debate me to the death. Yeah, I've I said the same fucks, thing. Nigga. Yeah, yeah. That nigga is the innovator of reality rap West Coast. Mm-hmm. Anybody yeah. say Big anything facts. different? Big facts. We 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 we, we just got to line it up. I mean, we, we, we understand. We understand. It, we do. understand it. Of course, you had Tidy T and all of them, and you had Easy. Yeah, which blew up. Yeah, they you know, blew up. But, but Ice T was, was already was yeah, six in right. the morning. Because they got inspired that, by be, they got squeeze inspired, the trigger and he, six he, in the morning. Well, he yeah. was inspired by the homies, by my homies. Right. You know, all of them dudes out of the Harlem's and everything, mm-hmm. these was real players. These yeah. was real dudes hitting real licks, real street dudes, right. real players. And they was telling them to put this in mm-hmm. these raps. Talk about this real life because mm-hmm. nobody had done that. Nah. And Ice, he actually went on record and said he got inspired, like you said, by the homies, but also, what was it, PSK mm-hmm. 13 or whatever right. in New York. Right, yeah. exactly. But he, the homies was telling him to put it in there, homie. Mm-hmm. And so when he put that on record mm-hmm. and he started talking about it, he's talking about their life. Yep, the L.A. And culture. The L.A. culture, the L.A. lifestyle. Yeah. And when he did mm-hmm. this, it was a paradigm shift because – it was relatable music, and it changed the West Coast hip hop scene forever because nothing had been seen. No one had spoke for us. No one had could speak for us riding in a deuce with the top off, nigga, under these palm trees with our curls swinging, nigga, with this G funk in the car, my nigga, with that burner on the seat, nigga. You can't, you can't make this up. Yeah. This is what we live. Yeah. This is what we do. That's why I asked you earlier who was your influence because Ice T was mine. See, right, right, I heard, right. I had heard Run DMC and all that shit, Ice-T and it was, was cool. Yeah, yeah. But when I heard Six Man, in the Morning yeah, and exactly. Squeeze the Trigger, Come on, that's when nigga, I was like, this nigga, pull oh, up it's different with these dark yeah. locs on, yeah, hair flowing, yeah, motherfucking hat on, <laughs> nigga, 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 looking like a gangster from the yeah. epitome of gangster <laughs> ice. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like what? Yeah, I'm sitting there like this, like we like this. Oh my god! Then yeah. when Easy and them came, yeah. when Easy come. I'm like this nigga look just like us. Yeah. This these this these niggas is wearing Pendletons. Mm-hmm. They got khakis on. Yep, the they got Davis buffalinos on. They they got <laughs> buffalinos. The man, what? Yeah. This is us. They got hair and bones. Mm-hmm. Then I remember DJ Quick come. Yep. Oh my God, we like MC8 come. And even so, Quick before before Quick is the name with the underground tapes. Mm-hmm. Oh really? Now Quick. them was the first tapes that that took. Listen, them underground. Yep. tapes when he dropped them in Compton yeah 
they had Compton on fire. See, back then it used to be the Compton swap meet. Mm -hmm. So you could go to the Compton swap meet and you could you you had to go to the swap meet to get them tapes. Mm -hmm. They was back then we had I know all your young <laughs> listeners out there a tape. What the fuck is Yeah, yeah, tape? yeah. They don't know what they don't know is. what the <laughs> fuck we talking about here. But it was tapes. Yeah. And you had to go to and when you it was a bunch of mom and pop, you know. Koreans in there that sold mm -hmm. these yeah. tapes. And you know, you had to go to the swap meet to mm -hmm. get these. Wasn't no iMusic, Apple Music. Yeah. And, Man, you know, I always say, bro, Quick don't get enough credit. Especially, I mean, he's a great producer, phenomenal. But the nigga you know, was always a lyrical but nigga, man. He was, but he was the first nigga, even before Bloods and Crips, to really be banging on wax. That nigga was banging on He was the first one. That nigga was to on. really just kind of. Yeah, he was out there, really. homie, and he really just put it out there yeah. in a way, but his quickness his wittiness his cleverness and his ability to not only produce the track right was a hybrid before his time yeah we didn't know any rapper that was lyrically inclined right. that was producing like that then so you you had dr dre right you, we can't forget dr dre right. this is a nigga who could write and a nigga who but could him produce. And Quick is different because Dr. Dre could produce, he could arrange, arrange hear, but he could mix it. But he had Ren and them mostly writing his shit. Yeah, you know was, what I'm saying? To a degree. To a degree. But a degree. Quick was 15, 16 yeah, yeah. doing them underground doing them, tapes, yeah, producing yeah, and yeah. writing. I mean, that's that a nigga, genius in That itself. nigga is, man, you got to realize this, man, for a nigga to be able, you know, his name was DJ Quick. Right. So that nigga was, you know, he knew this shit. Mm -hmm. And when I, I'm hearing, it, you know, at this time, I would like to say that I've always been this lyrically, you know, inclined nigga. Yeah. And, you know, that that's only for, you know, the people who listen to my music to really mm -hmm. just entail to delve into and just be able to see and understand that. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at his body of work back then and his lyrical ability and his mm -hmm. ability to make <clears throat> tracks. Yeah. Man, that's a West Coast legend. Absolutely. Homie. Period. We gotta get, man, shout out to Quick. We got to get out him to Quick, the homie. show. I told Ice T, I said, my nigga, and producer Ken, no. I, what I got in my house? I got the paintings so the of power. power. Yeah. Yeah. I got the big ass paintings, oil paintings in my house. You man. know what I'm saying? When I heard uh, Power and I heard uh, High Rollers, right. that's what helped me get Street Poison. I was right. like 13 when right. I heard that shit. And I was like, Oh, that's what I want to do. Right I there. I seen the video. I was right. like, that's what I want right there. I just knew, homie, when after he was on me the way that he was on me, you know, that's when, you know, Rich yeah. introduced me. I'm 16. He introduced me to the <clears> homies, <throat> my big homie, Big Dav, you know, big, you know, Killer Nitty, my nigga, Big Killer Watt, all of the homies from the hood. Um, definitely, you know, they, it wasn't, it wasn't so much as a, a banging thing. It was a thing in, in which these people are my family. Right. And they ingratiated me and raised me. They knew me when I didn't even know myself. Right. And wanted to influence me to do something differently. Mm -hmm. You know, they like, this is what we doing and this is what you doing, but you got an opportunity. Right. You got an opportunity. We've been doing this for 30, 40 years. Yeah. But you got an opportunity and they were able to, you know, with Rich bringing me around, because Big Rich was a big influence. Mm -hmm. Because he was this person that just has these ingenious concepts and ideals and schemes. And he would always sit there and talk to me before I would rap. Mm -hmm. You know, I need to understand how a nigga feel right now riding in that Cutlass. Mm -hmm. This nigga got $10 in his pocket. He just drunk him a tall can. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? He got a baby on the way. His enemies on the other side of the hood. Mm -hmm. He got some real life shit going on. So he was A and R in you. Yeah, yeah, he, he was A and R in me yeah. before I knew what an yeah, A and R was. Right, right. He was like, nigga, I need to know what it yeah. feel like right now, man. Yeah. I need you to explain to these niggas what that nigga, who that nigga is. Mm -hmm. You that nigga, you gotta explain that to him. I need you to be able to tell the story of this nigga's life. And he used to always, he said, man, just imagine this cold nigga, man. You know, sometimes you look at life in the mirror and, you know, the mirror look right back at your ass. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, he used to just yeah. say shit to me. <laughs> yeah. And it would just be. And so he, well, was, he was your OG at the he, time. He, he, he was the OG, okay. homie. So, yeah. you know, uh, he was one of those people from the from from my from that neighborhood that, you know, from the hood that just always kept me in that, you know, he was like, no, I don't want you on this shit, man. Mm -hmm. Fuck that shit. Let's do this shit. So, you know, my whole going back and forth to Compton, mm -hmm. you know, still doing that. So I'm always going to always, you know, Compton mm -hmm. is my heart. You know what I mean? 
It just so you did. Up. So with that, you did. You were doing demos with Rich and the, the influence of Ice T. Them getting you in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Start doing demos. Not really demos. Just recording, trying to okay. perfect my shit because I wasn't even demo ready back then. Right. My shit was all over the place or whatever. Not so. I just continued to record and record and record and develop and write and write and write. And at the same time, man, I'm I'm still trying to get yeah, out here. Yeah. I'm still trying to make money. You still got to eat and pay bills. Oh man, you know what? Dream. The, yeah. the, the 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 crazy part about it is, is you know, my mom. You know, she got three boys, so she always did everything that she could do. She didn't abandon us. She didn't go stick us in some home or nothing like that she she thugged it out with us Mm -hmm. but she also didn't baby us she understood we was you know she knew it was wolves out there we was puppies was your dad in the house no no you know i had a step pops at the time you know he was you know pretty older older dude so it was like yeah Yeah, okay really keep up you uh, he couldn't really you know we had a whole different speed even mom's at a different speed Mm -hmm. you know you still you know there and right here at this but I love him nonetheless because, you know, he really helped my mom as much as he can. But, you know, as we begin to approach our adolescence, you know, the distance and mm-hmm. years and mm-hmm. philosophy starts and understanding yeah. and yeah. we, you know, we starting to smell ourselves. And Hey, my mama used to say that you start smelling your piss. Yeah, yeah, you start yeah. smelling yourself, <laughs> and, you know, so yeah. that broadened out and just like, sh- yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, fall back, OG. So in essence, you you kind of left to your own devices yeah, and making so your own that, choices. Yeah, and that yeah. ended up me, you know, yeah. me and mom's falling out and, you know, me leaving home and mm-hmm. just being out there, just, you know. So when did you get a get your, get your a break? When did you see that, okay, this music shit is something viable. I can make this shit happen. Like what? I never really seen that just viable for a lot of years, man. Mm-hmm. You know, for a lot of artists, you know, that's out there, they've been doing music forever, and I had been doing music for a long, 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 long time. Mm-hmm. And um, I had been writing, but I always was hustling, mm-hmm. you know. And it was only after my wife had passed, um, mm-hmm. my first wife had passed, um, that I had the opportunity. And the opportunity came in a package. It was so disguised that... The day that I ended up recording, it's so crazy because my wife had just passed. I just said, fuck rap. And I really had told myself, I really ain't going to do this shit no more. I'm good. Fuck rap. I told my brother that shit. And he was like, what? I said, man, I ain't doing that shit no more, homie. He like, you for real, black? And the look in his face, because the seriousness of my face, but he was smart enough to look at me and understand that I was truly dealing with the passing of someone that I truly loved. Mm-hmm. And understanding this, he was like, he kept trying to pull me out of that funk. He understood essentially that I was in a in a in a in a real life funk. And um when he realized that he it was his birthday. And so this dude he called me up and he was like, yo, bro, for my birthday, you know, can you do me a favor? He's like, you, can you come to the studio, you know, for my birthday? And I'm like, man, bro, you know I ain't fucking. No, no, I'm just recording. I'm recording, bro. I'm just recording. Mm-hmm. And so I get there to the studio and he'd already had did a record or whatever. And he was just so happy. He was like, Black, I want you to hear this track. And I hear the track and I hear the words to the track. Well, I did that track and I ended up doing three more tracks which became my demo. Okay. Okay. And it wasn't officially a demo. It was three songs, but those three songs Mm -hmm. um, ended up getting me a record deal. Wow. So let me ask you this. So had you that, you know, everybody, when you, when you dropped and for those who don't, you know, some of the youngsters that meet that could be looking at this, they not familiar. Did you already have that? Because everybody, obviously, you your your voice, right. you know, your cadence, you sounded like Biggie. Right, you know? right, right, right. Did you always have that? Was that something that was like, for instance, like when we rapped, we we had been rapping fast in the right. early '90s, right. and when Bone Thugs came, right. we had already been doing that, 
but right. we did borrow a little bit from them, which aided in us getting the record deal with them right, because right. we were his version <laughs> of Bone Thugs. Right, right. So right. did you already have that? And then with the influence of Biggie, you said, okay, I'm going to lean into that. You know what? I think more than anything, you know, I was already lyrical. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Big in his own right is the lyrical God, if you right. want to look at it to that extent. He was always, he has the, the lyrical ability that I haven't seen in any other artist to this day still, mm -hmm. you know. On top of that, the persona and his flyness and his swag yeah. or whatever not. Especially for the big guys. Exactly, definitely. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, coming from a different era and a different range. So mm -hmm. I couldn't even get close to that. I'm just always in my own lane. But I think mm -hmm. over a period of time, my lyrical ability began to step up a lot mm -hmm. better and a lot greater. And I've always been deep voiced. It. So right. me being able to. Okay, boom, all right, I'm going to swag this this way. I can swag that yeah. this way. And I got my own writing ability right. to be able to pull this off to this. So now I got, okay. And so, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, even with the tonality of your voice. Right, like, right. Did you, was you rapping? And then when Biggie, you was like, oh, shit, my shit right, sound right. familiar. Right, right. Was people around you like, right, right. you sound like Biggie. Right, 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 right. I mean, tonality. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, I've always been deep voiced. Yeah, yeah. I've always yeah. been deep voiced. So... It's no other way right. for it to come out but deep. Right, right, right. There's, my, there's no other hey, way. Hey, I ain't going to lie, bro. When we used to, uh, when we, you and I did that song 15 right. years ago, you know, people would say, man, he sound like Biggie. He woo, woo, woo. Right, right. And I would tell, i say, but the nigga sound like that, though. Right, like, right. That's how he talk. Yeah, you know so, what I, mean? I mean, when you look at everything and you yeah. understand it for what it is, like, I mean, I've always been deep voiced. Mm -hmm. You can't change that. But when you really delve into Biggie's records and the mm -hmm. style and the way that he wrote records mm -hmm. and the way that he approached a verse and the way that I approach a verse, you can't knock that. Right. You could say, oh, well, maybe he took a little bit of the cadence. Okay. Yeah. But you can't never compare the two. Tone-wise, right. it's a whole different mm -hmm. way of he swagging words. I'm from the West Coast. From the West Coast. Talk. The slang li and the dialect li li is going to be different. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, to most people, we sound slow. Yeah. We sound slow as a motherfucker. Yeah. I could never... I know a lot of y'all out there from different, you know, areas out yeah. the country. Yeah. You know, just recently, you know, I was, you know, just chopping it up with a few people, you know, and they had a birthday party and they was like, you sound like you from, you yeah. from here. Yeah. I was like, what you mean? You sound slow. <laughs> I'm like, I sound slow. Yeah. Well, we from, we from this part of the Carolinas, you know, we from North Carolina. Yeah. But you sound slow. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, but yeah. I'll tell you, you know. It is but what it is. You, so... You know, it could never, you know, yeah. I could never talk like a New York nigga. Right, right. Period. So, so, so a New York you, nigga could never yeah. talk like a West Coast nigga. Right, right. And a New York nigga could never rap about West Coast shit. And right. a West Coast nigga could never rap about New York shit. Right, right. So, you know, it's just a whole different thing. Yeah. And so, yeah. So when you, so that led to your record deal. Right. And your record deal was with? Virgin. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, so. So what was that like? Because, I mean, you a nigga from Compton trapping. Right. You know what right, I'm saying? Right. You've been playing with this rap thing. Right. Now, all of a sudden, you got somebody really want to do business with you. Right, right. So what what was that like? I mean, Making it wasn't transition. an immediate transition right away, mm -hmm. man, to keep it real with you, Court. It took a minute for that transition to actually take place. And so understanding that these are three songs that's cut and I'm having meetings with different record companies, Def mm -hmm. Jam West, and they had Dub C at the time. Right. I'm going to Warner, and I'm talking to different execs over at Warner, and I'm mm -hmm. talking to different execs from a few different labels at the time. So there's a lot of opportunity that's out there, but I think more than anything, which, which was impressionable upon, upon me was the fact that Pete Farmer, mm -hmm. you know, which was my A&R at the time. I remember Pete Farmer. He would yeah. continuously be at me like, yo, Black, you need to do this. And, at the time, I'm working and I'm trapping. Mm -hmm. I'm doing two things. I'm working and I'm trapping just to be able to pay my Real bills. Real quick, Pete Farmer was, didn't he work with Lil Easy too? Yeah, he did okay. work with Lil okay. Easy. Okay, yeah, so. Definitely, okay, definitely. Uh, shout out to Lil E. Yeah, he came on the show too. Definitely, yeah. definitely. It's a good nigga, man. Good nigga. Oh, yeah, that's my guy. Good dude, yeah. good dude. Um, but, so the opportunities just wasn't there like that. Mm -hmm. Well, they were at that time, but he was a key force and factor in continuously pushing me in that path of believing that I could actually do the shit. Mm -hmm. Because even with that and me hearing companies 
I just really thought they was on some bullshit to keep a mm-hmm. G with you. Mm-hmm. My mind wasn't even that open. I was only in one range of thinking like, nigga, I'm finna go to the street and go get the money, get the bag, go mm-hmm. do this, do that. Mm-hmm. Even with them talking, you talking, I, you know how we was right. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. We, it ain't yeah. a lot of talking. We, yeah, yeah, we yeah, about getting talk, to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that talk, you know, I don't believe, <laughs> I don't believe, yeah. I don't believe nothing out here and half of what I see. Real talk. So that's just the way I was raised. So I'm hearing them, you know, that. so for me, I'm already in this set of mind, mm-hmm. like, okay. So Pete was like, no, it's real. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Go get me a bag then. Yeah. And Pete went and got me a bag. Like, yeah. here, nigga, here go 14 bands. Oh. And that was from Virgin? Yeah, from Virgin. Okay. Pete went and got me a bag. I'm sitting around there. I needed a bag, man. Yeah. Boy, my, man, I'm, I ain't even man. gonna I ain't even gonna ask yeah. what you did with the 14. Hey man, don't even Because I'm already <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask. I'm already okay. I, all don't right. even ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that part. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 That part. Yeah. You know, that's probably I mean, yeah. probably 18. You know, yeah, but anyway, yeah, 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 yeah. But anyway, oh, yeah. check it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> you know, I was man. My, you know, my yeah. lips is white as Al Hayman. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> <That's tough>. shit. <laughs> shit, man, I was fucked up. So he dropped that bag off on the nigga, man. What? Yeah. He dropped off a party pack? <laughs> oh, man, what you say? So, oh, man. so, so it was, I was real. Like, when he did that, I was like, oh, it's real. Yeah. So I'm like, man, and then Pete, he had, you know, the production that was around and he was influential and he had all of the pieces to the puzzle and. Pete, you know, definitely mm-hmm. was just like, nigga, we finna do this shit. Yeah. So that's that that just changed the whole game and mm-hmm. he changed my mind frame. Like, no, nigga, you can't just you can't just be in the hood no more. Right. Like, you need to be up here at the office. You need yeah. to be listening to tracks. You need to be up here meeting these people. Yeah. And so this is a total transition. This is a whole culture shift. Yeah. Me being I'm used to standing on the corner, niggas shooting dice, niggas what holding year, what, year, what year was that, bro? That this was about 2000, 2002, 2003. Yeah, because when I met you, nigga, you had already had a hit single yeah, album out, yeah, exactly. and you were still, I was like, nah, did this nigga sign? When I first met yeah, you, I was like, yeah. this nigga act like he came straight from the spot. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 you because, you know, it, once it's ingrained, <laughs> nigga, it's ingrained. Yeah, I was nigga, like, <laughs> and nigga. then we start having yeah. conversations. Hey, I was like, nigga, hey, I'm hey, like, man, nigga, you is signed, ain't hey, you? man, nigga, you cannot forget pit bulls and curls, nigga. You just can't, you can't, it's shit yeah. real. It's just certain yeah. things that's ingrained and embedded in your DNA, man. Yeah. You can't change up the genetic make of it. It's just what it is. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That shit is in you. It ain't on you, Pippa. Yeah, so once you see that and it develop into that, it's, it is what it is. So that conditioning of the, that conditioning for so many years just came out through my cognition and the choices that I was making. So on let every me ask level. you: Do you think that that worked against you in that space? Not being able to fully. Do you feel like you were ever able to fully transition into that position of being okay? I'm an artist. I am. I arrived. I'm Gorilla Black. Right. You know what I'm I mean, to be honest with you, I could never really fully take on everything, even though because my mind state. Mm-hmm. So I did make some changes to be open minded about coming to. Yeah. I would always be at the office every single fucking day, mm-hmm. but I took on the attitude of these people are in charge of if I fail or win. Mm-hmm. I need to build relationships. Mm-hmm. In me and my brother, my mm-hmm. brother was very influential in that. Like black. We need to go and have a meeting with her. Mm-hmm. Hey there, how you doing? You mind if we have a time? So what is it that you do? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm the one who does this with your project and does this with your project and does this with your project. I'm responsible for all of these things. Mm-hmm. I did work on these albums, these albums at this company with these other artists in it. Oh, wow. So what do you think that I should do? Is that you... Violet Brown? No, no, no. It was okay. just different people at, okay. at the label at the time okay. because I had started working just up there at the company, just being able to understand what, who was in charge of all of the promotion material, yeah. who would be in charge of mix show, who would be in charge of getting these records in the program director's hands, who would be in charge of how the videos would be distributed, who would be in charge of, you know, the street team, who would be in charge of when I got there, because, you know, back then it was different parts of the country that you had different 
people that would be from different parts of the right. street team that they yeah. were out, outsourced, outsourced from the it. company. Absolutely. So I had to learn this shit on the fly mm -hmm. while I'm being an artist. So I had to take on the mantra that I got to approach this shit as a business street nigga. Mm -hmm. Business street nigga. So I could be able to, oh, okay. Yeah, now I understand. Can you repeat yourself? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so and so. This is what I do. This is what I've done. This is this. And at the same time, hey, nigga, go get my motherfucking bag up out of there. My nigga, we need to get over here and go get some Wendy's real quick. Yeah. We got to be over here at the radio station, nigga, at one o'clock. Right. This shit's serious. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, I had to wear multiple hats and I had to learn on the fly how the game worked and I had to do it in a fairly quick amount of time because this shit is money. Yeah. So you just did an artist deal, one album? No, I had signed for two albums and four options. That was my deal. Okay, with Virgin. With Virgin. Okay. So <clears throat> whose idea was it to do? So you do the first single with you, excuse me, and Beanie Man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who, how did that come about? Wow, that was, that's crazy that you asked that question because we were in Memphis at the time. And I was working with a producer named Carlos Brody. Mm -hmm. Shouts out to Carlos Brody. Carlos Brody done worked with some of the most talented motherfuckers in the game. Work with Diddy. Work with, man, you name it, he's worked with him, man. Name an artist and he's pretty much worked on him. And um, I would never forget, uh, I want to say, um, yeah, I heard the intro of the Belly movie. Yep. And I told him I wanted him to sample that. And... I wanted him to sample, you know, that intro of the Belly movie. And so when I um, hear the sample back and I'm like, damn, wow. And I'm like, okay, cool. I go to writing my verses on my head and everything, boom, 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 boom. And so it's, it's a song with no hook. So the label send the song out to Beanie Man. Beanie Man tracked the hook and it come back crazy. Yeah. Because Beanie Man was my label mate. Okay. At Virgin. And so, man, he tracked the hook and I mean, it was fucking incredible. Yeah, bro. it's a dope I mean, song. Super it's still a dope song. Dope. Yeah. And that man just, when, it, it, I remember Pete was like, nigga, when you get here to the office, I'm finna blow your whole top loose. Mm -hmm. Nigga, we hear Beanie Man, I'm like, oh my God, he murdered it. Mm -hmm. And man, we you know we listening to the shit, and so next thing you know, the whole company like that's his record, right? Because it was so different. It had this Jamaican mm -hmm. with the patois, yeah, Compton. Sure. It was, it was just this whole different mosh of different elements that made this record, and it was friendly enough to be street yeah. enough, yeah. but it crossed over enough, but it carried. Even the visual. I, yeah, I the, remember y'all had the pri private jet and yeah, shit, exactly. you know what I mean? So, but yeah. then you see us in the looters yeah, yeah, and in the neighborhood. Yeah, so it yeah. was just, it was super dope, man. And now that I'm looking back at it and I'm thinking about it, it was just a unique song for a West Coast artist, something that nobody had done. And I think that it was ingenious, man, that it would be the single. I didn't think that it should have been, been the single. And that song charted, where did it chart? I can't remember actually, but that's. I think uh, it was definitely top 100. Yeah, it was about. up there. I think it got up to 25 or 26, somewhere up there. I don't know. I, don't get me to lying, but it got up there. That song definitely got up there. Okay, so now you got a hit record on your hands. So what was that feeling like? Oh, man. Because now you really arrived. Yeah, real, I've arrived, real. man. Yeah. Just, I mean, it's, you know, that was a, a beautiful time in my life. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for that opportunity, man, mm -hmm. because I got to get out there. And I met so many different people, man. I did 200 promo dates, man. Damn. Man, man, so you toured with that single? Oh, my God. What? Okay. I jumped on every stage, man, from here to motherfucking Kalamazoo. That's what's Shit up. with that damn song. I was, uh, <laughs> next thing you know, I looked up and I was in France in front of the Eiffel Tower singing Compton. Damn. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, that's, God, damn, yeah, what kind that's of an experience. And so, but uh, I was able to tour throughout uh, Europe and everything like that. And so, man, when you look back at it, man, it was just a beautiful experience. What man. did your What did your mom think? Man, my mama was super duper yeah. proud. I'll never forget, man, we had our mama on stage. And so I remember my mama, you know, told my wife, girl, you better get your ass up here. Uh -huh. Shit, they choosing that. <laughs> <laughs> they choosing. <laughs> mama, shit, you better get up here and get your man. <laughs> they will. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> my mama, my mama ain't put yeah. no cut on it. Yeah. Shit, mama dope. ain't have no cut. Mama was like, shit, girl, you better get your ass up here. <laughs> so they, they looking at my baby right now. <laughs> so so let me ask you this. How did you deal with, because I remember when it came out, you mm -hmm. know, 
know, because mm-hmm. the source was still a thing back then. Mm-hmm. The magazines, Double XL, all that. Right. So how did you deal with? Because I mean, there was motherfuckers that were supporting you, obviously. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because the single charted. Mm-hmm. But then you still had a you were you know you had your your level of being ostracized and all mm-hmm. of that shit by the hip hop community. Mm-hmm. How did you? How did you modulate that? You know what I'm saying? How did you balance like, okay, I'm doing my thing, but there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a crowd of hate over here too. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? How did you deal with that? Shit, I've been hated on my whole damn life, hell. Yeah. Hell, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't even supposed to get as far as I got. Mm-hmm. Shit. If I worried about a nigga hating on me, nigga, I would never be who I am. So you was basically like, fuck him. I'm <laughs> me. I mean, shit, I'm moving around out there. I'm going through the South. I'm in the Midwest. Yeah. What the fuck, man? What the fuck a nigga mouth? A nigga, not what another nigga say don't make me eat and ain't gonna make me shit. Mm-hmm. What you, nigga, what you, that don't make yeah. me shit, nigga. I yeah. can't go shit on that. Yeah. Nigga, yeah. what you, that don't feed my kids. I'm glad you don't like me. Yeah. Because at least you got my name in your goddamn mouth. That's how I And you know what? I want to thank all y'all. I do. <laughs> you keep talking shit about me. Please talk as much shit you want. Yeah. I am giving you full permission. Talk your shit. Yeah. Because I could give two fucks. I give zero fucks. Yeah. That don't make me. So that when was your I, attitude when I go, through all of that. What? Yeah. That's good. What? Yeah. You, listen, yeah. listen. That's how I should be. I'm a human being. Yeah. So- at any point, I would be affected, like as, as every human being. Mm-hmm. But when you rationalize, rationalize what's going on, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they're entitled to the way that they think and they feel. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't have to affect me. Right. I got control of what I think and Absolutely. what I feel about whatever the fuck <clears throat> they're doing. Absolutely. And I could give two fucks. I always say this, man. I always say you don't let the compliments go to your head and don't let the criticism go to your heart. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like that shit, yeah. That's real fly. That's right real there. shit right that's there. That's real shit. You know what I right mean? Because if you put your self validation in other people's hands, you're going, I have to always go back to them to get it. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So, exactly. So, this entertainment shit, you got to know who you are. Right. And it's it's subjective. Right, right. You know, right. you're going to have motherfuckers that love you and swear everything that you the best. It's, you gonna ve- have it's very. So, you, you got to understand. They have their opinions. Mm-hmm. They don't have all of the facts. Mm-hmm. A person that doesn't have all of the facts and the hard-based evidence to really sit down and be able to put something together and make a, 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 a conscious decision on, he's very subjective. Mm-hmm. He's not being objective at all. You don't know me, nigga. Right. You ain't never been with me, nigga. You ain't never seen me on the block. Mm-hmm. I don't even know you, nigga. Right. You don't know who the fuck I am. You don't know where the fuck I came from. But there's a whole bunch of niggas who do. Right, right. All throughout my city, all throughout L.A. County, all throughout different parts of the country. Mm-hmm. And they just, at the end of the day, they they able to say, okay, we done seen this brother come up from here. Mm-hmm. We done seen him knee high to the tadpole come all the way up. We done seen him. We done watched this boy. We watched him as a baby. Mm-hmm. We done seen him go through the highs. We done seen him go through the lows. We done seen it. I always, I'm always gonna like my mama said, nigga. Never, always let them see you smile, baby. Yeah, that's right. Let them see you smile, no matter what the fuck going on in your head. Let them see you smile. So they don't like that shit. So let me they don't like let, that. let me ask you this. So now, so you start getting. When did you uh, come under the management of Jimmy Henchman? Right. Well, the management of Jimmy Henchman. You know, at that time we was working on the project, and I hadn't had management, mm-hmm. and um. I never forget, you know, my boy Wafu, and uh, he was working with Don Diva Mag- magazine with my man Mavario and them, and they had came out to L.A. and they came to the hood, and you know, <laughs> Foo, I love you, boy. And, you, know, I love you too, Killer Nitty. But uh, he came to the hood and was shooting, you know, different things with the homies in the neighborhood, and he was shooting the shit or whatever. Not that, uh, you know, I had to pull up and make sure the scene was okay. You yeah. know, make sure. Stay safe. Right. right. You know where you're at. You know, but uh, the homies took care of him and made sure everything was straight. And, um, he, you know, Fu has always been the biggest proponent of me. And he's always been one of those dudes that just, man, fuck them niggas, son. Yo, where the spawn, son? You know, he one of them New York <laughs> yeah, niggas. He yeah, one of them, yeah, turned up. Yeah, he one of them turned up niggas, yeah. but he he's just loyal to, loyal to a T, man. And so um, he was like, yo, Black. Maybe, you know, at the time I was entertaining Benny Medina and a few other different people for management at the time. Mm -hmm. And so Jimmy, he was like, yo, Black, I think Jimmy has a lot of connects in the game. And he was connected to Barry Hankerson and all Mm -hmm. of them. And Mm -hmm. he was like, I think that's somebody who you should entertain and maybe you should sit down with him. And, 
you know, take into consideration after you sit down and weigh it all out, what's going to be feasible for you and what's going to make the most sense with dealing with the streets, we're dealing with the industry, we're dealing with your business and all of those different things to the aspect. So whenever me and Jimmy spoke, man, Jimmy is this soft spoken dude, you know, real, real cool dude, man. Mm-hmm. With You know, he just really, I just really felt like he 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 was from where I was from. Yeah, so he, he understood, understood you, what I was understand your brand exactly. You know, yeah. But not only that, he understood how the industry worked, right? Because he had had his hands in it for so so long, right? Dealing with so many different artists for so many years. Did you inherit some of the bullshit that came with Jimmy as well? I mean, you know, Jimmy approached everything with a business mind. Mm-hmm. And he has this beautiful mind for business and he had the ability to be able to go in and talk with the label about what was needed and what was not needed and things that needed to be allocated Mm -hmm. and understood how the project was supposed to be done Mm -hmm. because he understood the industry from within. Mm -hmm. And so he was able to speak the language that was resonating with these execs on budgets and things like that. And so at the same time, Jimmy understood the streets right? because he was raised in them. Right. So that stigma of him and how his street, you know, the things that he did in the street in his past and all of those things, you know, they were there, but I'm from a whole nother coast. Right. So it really didn't matter right. with all of those things that he had going over there because yeah. he was my management. I'm from the West Coast. Right, right. So I, I got to deal with this shit out here yeah you know you know even though so jimmy was that person to be able to go in and understand how things needed to be done he was able to understand how okay these are the shows this is a contract this is what we want we need the upfront money black they finna wire you your money i'm gonna go in here i'm gonna speak to larry what you need you need this and this out there yeah you need more posters out here black what do you think is not being done that type of frame. And at the same time, Jimmy could get into, you know, his street shit. Nigga, fuck wrong with these niggas over here. Right. Hey, Black, I need you to get your ass up, get on the motherfucking plane, get over there to the radio station. I need you there. I got, what's the call? I'm calling her. You'll be there yeah. at six. Boom, 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 boom. And the rest of them niggas, tell them niggas, man, what's up, man? Yeah, yeah. Boom, 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 boom. Bam. Yeah. Jimmy knew how to handle shit. Yeah. So how did it make you? Were you, were you already locked up when he got his life sentence? I was already locked up. Yeah, how'd that make you feel? Like, you know, because, I mean, y'all had business, but I'm assuming that y'all were, you know, yeah, personal. Yeah, I, I, man, I ate dinner with Jimmy mm. so many different times, and Jimmy sat down with me and chopped it up with me, and it hurt It hurt me, man, mm-hmm. because uh, you give a man life like that, man. Yeah. They just threw this man life away. And what did, and he, get, he, what did he get life for? Was it man, conspiracy I, or something? Listen, shit? man, come on, man. It, it does, Man, the shit, the shit is some bullshit to yeah. me. It's really some bullshit. I'm not finna go into the depths of his case, yeah. but y'all just took this man's whole life. What What did they even charge him? I don't even know what. I don't were. even know. That's why oh, I, okay. I'm not. I don't. Yeah, even, I didn't even. Know I, I have a. Was. I have a, a inkling. Okay. But I'm not gonna speak lest okay. I have again gotcha. all the of the facts, facts of yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. And I that ain't all I know is y'all threw a life. Yeah. Threw a life away. Yeah. In prison, took another black man away from his family, his kids. That shit ain't cool. I don't give a fuck what it is. You yeah. just took him away. I mean, completely. So, yeah, that shit. Look at all of the good shit that he did and all of the people that he helped throughout, you know, the music industry and the things that he did. So, yeah, we all have situations. We all go through different things. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying, okay, y'all could have gave him some tick. Y'all could have gave the man a little, okay, here, we're going to give you 15, 20 years. Get a man life? Life, yeah. So did they give him, he got light, well, shit, neither one of us know. We don't know the facts. Because I was about to say if he blew trial or if that's just what he copped to. But, you know, but anyway, um, so moving on from Jimmy. So at the time, Jimmy managed you Mm -hmm. and the game and who else? Um, He was managing Mario Winans. He managed, uh, what is it, Groove Theory? Yeah, Groove Theory. Yeah, Groove Theory. Um, He managed two, uh, Sharissa, I think. Okay. Remember the R&B I do. Uh, yeah. Chick named Sharissa. Yeah. You remember yeah. her? Vaguely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I think her name was Sharissa. And then, so no, was it Sharissa or Sharifa? Sharifa or Sharissa? Sharifa. 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 Yeah. yeah. Okay. We got to make sure we write. I know, right? <laughs> Producer Ken. <laughs> Sharissa or Sharifa? Hold on. <laughs> so <laughs> in the meantime, <laughs> we got to uh, make it. Make so it you and Game, y'all, y'all, y'all bump shoulders a little mm-hmm. bit. What right. was that about? I mean, man, I, I really, I'm still baffled to this day. Wow. I really don't know. 
Okay, maybe it was just some Compton shit. Maybe I he mean, just felt you I, nipping at his heels. I really, on some rapper I really shit. don't know. I really don't know. Mm-hmm. He, Y'all never had a conversation, man. The last conversation that I had with him was a conversation of me and him talking, mm-hmm. and me speaking to him and letting him know some things. And from there, the man just, and it wasn't even a negative conversation. Mm-hmm. Seventeen years later, I still don't know. Wow. And wow. I still don't know, and at the end of the day, man, that man did so much for the city. Mm-hmm. People may have their disregard for him. They may have their different feelings for him, but that dude is a part of West Coast hip-hop. Yeah, yeah. And regardless of, you know, he and I know, mm-hmm. and it's so old. Yeah. I think we both older, Yeah, and we've yeah. both grown, yeah. and I really, really think that we just at that time I had my people and he had his people and so both pulling us just, in different you think directions. It was just a lot of noise. It wasn't even nothing because that's how the shit go down. Right, 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 right. A right. lot of the times it don't be the two people; it be the motherfuckers around. And them. I do believe you that. I definitely do believe that. But me and him, we had a conversation, mm-hmm. and he and I know what that conversation is. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't even. And from there, I don't. I think that conversation, what I told him that day. Mm-hmm. It was just me being his friend. Right, right. I've always been his friend, and I've always— Y'all were friends prior to becoming— No, we really weren't friends, but as I began to okay. be around him and be around his character, he was a he Y'all no developed bad a dude. relationship. And, you know, he was cool enough for me to feel like, you know, my loyalty is to him first. Okay. And so I only shared him with him that information because of loyalty first. Gotcha. And so, you know, I never thought anything of it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I think, you know, some things took place, and— yeah. You know, where there was outside influences, maybe. Yeah. Maybe I'm being subjective, but that was the last time I talked to him. And, so now you Gorilla yeah. Black, you got game feeling some type of way about you, dissing you. And then you have Daz, right. the clear blue, trying right. to, you know what I'm saying? Right. So is that, what What was that for? Is that just because niggas is feeling the pressure of the music or is that on some personal shit or just niggas hating doing what they do? Well, it wasn't just niggas hating. It was just simple fact that I had went out and I had tracked some records mm-hmm. with Superfly and Daz. Mm-hmm. And so when I went out there and I tracked them, these were supposedly to be for mixtape. Mm-hmm. We were cutting mixtape records at the time, man. But it was a lot of records that we had cut. Like, yo, write a verse for this. You put a verse for that. Boom, 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 boom. So imagine, I, I, you know, I was out there, super fly house, man, and they ingratiated. They showed me so much love, him and Daz. And then next thing you know, I see a record that's sent to Pete. So when they sent the record to Pete, he was like, hey, nigga, you heard this? Nigga, you, nigga that shit is crazy with Snoop. Mm-hmm. With Snoop? He was like, yeah, nigga, the record y'all did with Snoop. Mm-hmm. I didn't do a record with Snoop. I did a record with Daz and, and, and Superfly, mm. but they went and had Snoop to jump on the record. And so Snoop on the record, boom, 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 and he going hard. And I'm like, okay, that shit hard as fuck. Hey, oh, they put Snoop on there? I'm like, damn, word, that shit hard as a motherfucker. But they want 50 bands for the record. They want 50 thousand for the record mm-hmm. well shit me and snoop we need to go in there and cut this record again and mm-hmm. nigga maybe we could do some changes here yeah, do it right. ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. and as yeah. well as me you know envelop that relationship and so forth and um more than anything um that's that's the way that my approach was mm-hmm. like you know i'm not gonna give them 50 bands right away i think that's something we need to you know because mm-hmm. i did a record with nate dog and mm-hmm. shit i gave nate dog damn near 100 bands right so Damn. I mean, yeah, I gave him a hundred bands. It's not. It wasn't about the money. Mm-hmm. It was about me developing the relationship and the chemistry to build a song. Mm-hmm. Like when I did that song with Nate Dog, I never forget, nigga. This nigga had a twenty piece chicken, a motherfucking thing of Hennessy, and that nigga said, "Listen, man, you hear that beat in there, nigga? You gotta come hard, homie. You gotta come hard as fuck." I'm like, nigga, watch, man. I'm no, no, no. Listen, homie. Listen, homie. Nigga, I know what I'm finna do. You, your big ass, you got to go in there and kill this record. This is what he tell me. I'm like, this nigga's a West Coast legend. I got to do my best. (laughs) Nigga, I must have, nigga, I'm writing verses and shit. I'm outside smoking Newports. I'm stressed the fuck out because this nigga, this nigga sitting in here, homie, this nigga did it so effortlessly. This nigga eat some chicken, 
roll up some fire ass be real kush because back then it wasn't no kush yeah only nigga i knew had kush was be real yeah be real shouts out nigga you had that oh this shit this all oh, you was the precursor you are the yeah yeah the kush this god strain still killing right nigga, now. what nigga yeah. that nigga shit was like yeah, that still... nigga i remember we went to fred wreck house nigga <laughs> i remember i went to that motherfucker all-star weekend nigga me i would have brought some of that shit to benzino nigga i damn near went to jail fucking around out there <laughs> motherfucker by uh by uh, crustaceans fucking with uh yeah. f- with be that be real that shit was so loud I had it in an envelope yeah. man the motherfucker he was acting like he valet he undercover police officer man we rolled the weed the window down man it smelled like ten motherfucking acres growing <laughs> and the motherfucker man said nigga this Beverly Hill Police Department step out of the car I look over to the left of my brother my brother like punch it I said nigga we won't even make it to the freeway Fuck nigga no not Beverly Hill nigga what <laughs> nigga that barricade that motherfucker throw down the motherfucker strip nigga you hear the tires pop poop pop and let this motherfucker yo man. <laughs> Your bitch Real ass spill. ain't going nowhere. Hey, listen. <laughs> listen. So anyway, this is the relationship I had with Nate. Nate was like, nigga, I need you, nigga, every bar. So this is the chemistry that I want to create with Snoop Dogg, the legend, the god of the motherfucking West. Why wouldn't I? Mm-hmm. I'm not just going to pass some bread over, nigga. I don't mind passing the bread to the big homie, but I want the big homie... I want that mentoring. Yeah. I want the relationship him. is the value. Yeah, the relationship is one thing, yeah. but this is a nigga who's so... Hundreds of millions of records. Right. So he can sit down and say, hey, little homie, I might need you to rewrite that verse a few times, homie. Mm-hmm. Okay, for sure, big homie. Mm-hmm. What What you think about that? Uh, you might have to come a little harder. <laughs> That's how Nate Dogg yeah. did me. Yeah. Was I upset? No. Nah, right. He rolled my ass. Homie, yeah. I must have wrote damn near five verses for that song. Nate Dogg choked. The two verses you hear on that song yeah. is the ones that the homie liked it. God yeah. bless the dead man, Nate Dogg. Listen, the man ate a whole damn thing of chicken, drunk some Hennessy, blew a thing, and went in there and killed it. One take Jake. Mm-hmm. Went back late. I said, I'm sitting there like this. Nigga, I start smoking more cigarettes. <laughs> and my brother like, nigga, you got to come hard, man. Yeah. I'm, he's like, I think you tripping today. This might not even be your day. Damn. I went in there, that motherfucker. He had a, he had a little booth in his garage. Yeah. Nigga, I went in there, nigga. I was in that motherfucker sweating, nigga. Like I was <laughs> like I was in a chicken coop because he had a little booth. Yeah. You know, my big ass barely squeezed in there. They had to stuff my ass in there and shut the door. You know what I'm saying? I'm in that and motherfucker. Your brother sweating. hit you with the shit, the shit. Yeah, make you not even want to drive. Yeah, yeah, man. No support, <laughs> nigga. He was he was like, nigga. I don't know if you gonna be ready. That nigga. He said, did you hear the hook in there? Yeah, nigga. That nigga. Coast to coast. I'm like, whoo, shit. <laughs> But Man, that's nigga. when the, that's when the shit dope, cause like I had the same thing, dog. Catch, shout out to KLC from Beats by the Pound. Right, right, right. Nigga, when I first got to No Limit in '95, right. oh my god, that nigga was like, I swear he used to pick on me. Like yeah. when I came in the studio, I was a part of a group. It be right. all of us, right? right? As soon as I come in the studio, that you got your shit. It's like he just <laughs> singled me out, and I, you know, I felt like I was in trouble. I'm like, yeah. He was like, you do yours last, bro. Right, Because he right, would keep right. me after. Right, Like, right. he was keeping me in detention after school. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? At KLC, man, shout out to the yeah. homie. He would stand at the window in the booth right. and stare at me. Do it again. Yeah. Come harder. Do it again. Do it again. Oh, my God. I be hey, in that bitch sweating. Bitch sweating. Yeah. You in there, the headphones <laughs> wet. <laughs> man. Man, I mean, ain't no air in here. You feel real nervous. That's just motherfuckers that, that they see it in you and they, they you need that. They push right. You. As, yeah, you need that. Yeah. So, back to that situation. We ended up cutting that. That record ended up being, you know, when Jimmy came on to my management, Jimmy mm-hmm. had a management team. Mm-hmm. And a lot of records, Jimmy wanted to listen and hear through all of the records. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I was going to New York cutting mixtapes. Mm-hmm. So I hear a mixtape with that song on it. Well, I first hear Daz go on Dub CNN or one of them websites and say, yeah, when I see Gorilla Black, I'm going to kill him. I'm like, what? You gonna kill me? I'm like, you gonna you gonna kill me? <laughs> I took. I, I gotta remind you now. I go into street nigga mode. This nigga say he gonna kill me. Okay, okay, all right. Yeah, we gonna see about that. And so my mind went into an emotional, unbalanced place to where now I want to act because this nigga saying this shit. And you know, looking back at it in hindsight, you know. This nigga is one of the West Coast legends. Mm-hmm. This is a nigga who helped break what we know today culturally as the West Coast. So I've always looked up and listened right. to this nigga. So for him to say he going to kill me, yeah. not only am I truly disappointed, mm-hmm. but I'm irate. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay. So I didn't, 
And then when I realized what he was saying it about, because I heard the mixtape with that song on it and that song wasn't supposed to ever be out. And so I'm like, who in the fuck dropped the ball and just took this song and put it on a motherfucking mixtape? Mm-hmm. It was totally disrespectful. And so that's disrespect. That fucking record don't, that record wasn't even cleared by them niggas. Right. It would, them niggas hadn't even been paid for their work. Mm, right. But I wasn't responsible for that shit. Yeah. But instead of him calling me or getting at me, mm-hmm. he said he gonna kill me. I ain't had nothing to do with that shit. So imagine not only me disappointed, but being irate right. at what this man has said. And, you know, looking at it in hindsight, he didn't know. Mm-hmm. He just felt like nigga just took his record and just threw it out there. Did y'all, did y'all, have y'all had a conversation? We still haven't had a conversation over all of these years. Damn. I just think, man, at this point, I've grown so much and I look back at everything and, you know, man, shout out to Daz. Daz definitely has put his hands down throughout this musical landscape here on the West Coast. For, sure. for, you know, me to sit around and be on some shit that happened 18 years ago, man, I've grown so much, man. I, I'm past that, man. I'm able to really appreciate mm-hmm. where I was at and who I am inside of this West Coast hip hop and who he is to this West Coast hip hop. Right. And I, I think that it's, it's, it's water under the bridge, man. Yeah, when you really sure. look at it because, yeah. you know, it's, it's just a record, but at the end of the day, he really didn't know the real story, and yeah. I'm hoping that he is starting to hear it. But even it was the never shit that you're saying, like the you know, it seems to be a common thread, even with with game and Daz, mm-hmm. a lot of miscommunication, you miscommunication, know what I'm and, uh, and, and when I, there's a communication deficit, right, and people begin to be subjective, mm-hmm. and people begin to be open, you know, closed minded, mm-hmm. that's when cynicism and foolishness. Enter into the play and ego and ego. Yep, from all sides. Yep, and so I definitely take responsibility for my parts in those things. Yeah, because regardless mm. of the record is in my hands, regardless of, but with the situation with Gang, I was telling him from a place of loyalty and love. Mm-hmm. My loyalty and love came first. Mm-hmm. So the way that he reacted afterwards. Mm-hmm. So I'm not apologetic in that yeah. because he and I know what that conversation <clears throat> entailed in depth. And I, you know, he knows. And after that, that's when it changed. With that situation with Daz, pretty much yeah. that situation in itself, he knows I didn't have control of the record, bro. And I didn't. And you know what? It's funny, bro, because not funny like ha ha, but the, the commonality is. Like even with myself, I say this all the time, dog. We come from the hood, like you said. We're we're taught to suppress, you know, feelings. We're taught to suppress. Like say for instance, we grown now, right? Right. right. We, me and you the same age. Exactly. If you <clears throat> say something or I say something, we have the maturity and the mental and emotional fortitude to come to each other and say, exactly. hey, black man, you my nigga, bro. But when you said such and such, man, you kind of yeah, hurt and, my feelings or you exactly. rub me the wrong and way. And he could have did that. And, but and, see, you got to remember, a lot of us, we young. We don't have see, the capacity we not taught, we or not the emotional taught that. stability right. or we the, not the, the cognitive. We, you know, like I said back earlier when we was talking, I was in the mm-hmm. cognitive behavior course. Mm-hmm. You know, all of us have cognitive distortion. Mm-hmm. And so whenever you're young, influenced by other people, mm-hmm. influenced by drugs, influenced by money, influenced right. by women, and all of this other shit, that shit doesn't even entail around that because you're, like, they're, niggas is not able to make nah. a, 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 a real conscious right. decision, a real weighed out, right. calculated, well thought out decision. So some, it's not just... I do this still to this day. Mm -hmm. I still struggle with, you know, cognitive distortion Mm -hmm. because sometimes I may assume some shit. Right. Assume. I say that word assume and I want it to be highlighted because when you assume something, now you're being subjective. Right. But but then, too, I I see this like we a lot of us, we youngins that come from the hood. I asked you, was your father in the house? You said no. Right. Right. But you had a stepfather, but a little out of touch. Right. 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 Same thing with me. Same thing with my homeboys. And the thing is, is our egos come into play because we so hyper aggressive. Nobody wants to, you know what I'm saying? Look weak. Nobody wants to, you know, be the first to reach out and communicate. You know what I mean? So now what happens is because like sometime with me and my homeboys, I remember the same thing. Like we fell out. Mm-hmm. We don't even remember what it was over. 20 years right. later, we like, what the fuck was it over? You know right. what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, 
we none of us really had like fathers, that male mm-hmm. figure in right. the house to teach us how to, you know, uh, mm-hmm. con- to resolve conflict. Right. With, without conflict resolution. Conflict it resolution. It wasn't without, there. Without the posturing. Because exactly. now what happens niggas is. Niggas just start posturing. Yeah. See, a nigga, a nigga going to be less, you know, yeah. inclined. And all of that posturing, that the posturing yeah. get way out of pocket. Out of pocket. Because. And niggas get killed over. Exactly. And Petty so shit. I think, again. It's just not even with niggas in the street. It's in relationships. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some again, I say this. Mm-hmm. You ever say, "Oh, d- you know," you hear someone said, "Maybe they need to go to marriage counseling." Right. And you know, a lot of black. Oh, what the hell? I ain't finna go in there and be talking to them white folks tell like them, that. Tell them my business. Tell them my the damn business. Folks. Yeah. Tell them my business to the white folks. <laughs> but sometimes we need someone from an unbiased Bias place up. to mediate. Yeah. To unpack this shit. Yep. Because a lot of things we're carrying as packages and bags, mm-hmm. and they weighing us down. You got mm-hmm. imagine having five Louis bags over here, five yep. Gucci bags. Yep. You rolling away this other Louis bag. Yep. You holding this one. You got shit on the floor. <laughs> Real you talk. Got a laptop and Mac. You, got, <laughs> you just and yeah. you just, you barely able to walk out of here. Yeah. Real talk. So you need someone to help you. Let me take this Louis bag. Yep. Because all that shit skews, all, all our experiences sometimes can skew our perspective. Exactly. And all this shit's perspective. And it's very much so perspective, and yep. it's because of the way that we challenge our way of thinking. Mm-hmm. Like, once we have an, a, a, an alternative in our mind, oh, this nigga think I'm a buster. Mm-hmm. Yep. Wait a minute. Yep. What if he's just having a hard day? Yep. You what if he's going, going some, through something? I don't know what the fuck he's going through. Right. I don't know what's going on in this man's head. Real talk. He could be really struggling right now. Mm-hmm. I know you like, oh, man, you know, what the fuck is that? But I have to, I, 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 I say the word I. Mm-hmm. I have to put myself in that mind frame because I've seen people get killed for less. Exactly. And not challenge themselves. Mm-hmm. So me able to challenge myself, I don't know what he might be going through, but you know what? All right, homie, I'm gone, man. Yeah. I'll holler at you a little bit a little later. Yeah. For me to create an exit strategy and create a boundary amongst him right now. Because clearly he and I are seeing two different viewpoints of this shit. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. It's okay. Because maybe you see something that I don't see. Right. Maybe what if I'm the motherfucker who wrong? Right, right. <laughs> Motherfuckers don't never me, consider that. that. What if what I'm thinking <laughs> yeah. right now is wrong? Yeah. And what if what he's telling me could change my life right. or save my life? Right. I never had that ability or those tools. But to that takes a think. level of uh, humility yeah, that most does. people don't possess innately. You know, that's exactly. some shit a lot of people have to mature to. Yeah, definitely exactly. you have to mature to it. And I think <clears> that they don't have or possess the tools to. Yeah. And so that's why I say when you look at couples, they go to marriage counseling because they have someone there with the tools mm-hmm. that could equip them. Right. So that there's no longer a communication deficit, mm-hmm. so that there's conflict resolution, right. so that they can unpack all of this baggage and process some of the shit and begin to heal. Mm-hmm. And giving them an outlet and a way to be able to like rational self analyze they selves and do a <clears throat> rational self analysis. Right. Themselves. I just came up with an idea though. You know how they have couples therapy to show? Right. Me and you gonna do niggas therapy. <laughs> <laughs> we gonna do niggas therapy. Me and you, we gonna help these niggas. Man, you know what I'm saying? Man. We gonna help these niggas. We gonna to help say. these I, I know rea- you're struggling, nigga. <laughs> I know a reality producer. We can put that together. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Producer Ken, that's the next show on the slate. <laughs> Nene, right. we, therapy, do, we know, doing the nigga we doing the nigga therapy, <laughs> Nene. Nigga Wake therapy. up. <laughs> we finna, we finna help everybody. We gonna start with Daz right. and Game. <laughs> we gonna start right. with Daz and Game. You know what, Jack, man? put the cameras. I together. love both of the brothers, man, and they yeah. both kings, man. And in this time, for sure. in this era, for man, sure. for what they've done here on the West for Coast, sure. they are two kings, man. And you know, you seeing what's going on in with our this new generation, and you see and what's going on. Mm-hmm. The small disagreements that we've had is nothing compared to the major shit that's on the arising out there and Mm -hmm. I'm not finna sit here and continue to carry on all of these different things when there's so many fish to fry. Absolutely. Especially with our people and especially Mm -hmm. with black men. I've been incarcerated for almost eight and a half years Mm -hmm. with nothing but black men and those black men, we were from all different areas of Compton, Watts, Long Beach, 
And man, I share so many beautiful times and memories with them. And, you know, all of us are out, you know, and I was able to, they became my family because you're in a place so long and all you got is your people. Mm -hmm. And when you see how the system kill us, man, and you did not only with <clears throat> bullets, yeah, but they kill us, yeah, with incarceration. Hell yeah, because you fragment the family unit. I mean, they put you on ice. I mean, the whole thing, even the mental part of it, you man, still have what? to get out and you have to reacclimate. You know, re yourself. I'm home yourself. now. This uh, it'll be seven months. Seven months, yeah. Seven months. So you have to understand, yeah. You know, in Europe, to give a man fifteen years is an act of parliament. Mm -hmm. Anything over six years over there is clinically institutionalized. Mm. They hand us 20 and 30 years like it's nothing. Like it's nothing. So you and then expect you to come home and, you know, saying and just go segue right into society. You can segue yeah. right back into society nah. because you got to understand everything that was hurt and everything that was crushed. My sons were left without a mentor, mm -hmm. without consultation, without a father. My wife was left without a provider, without a husband, without a lover, without a friend. My victims, however hard they had to go back to regain their identity or reclaim their cards, all of those things. I, myself, ended up being inside of a federal correctional facility, losing my mother, losing time, the most valuable resource that you could have on mm -hmm. earth. Right, right. Who won? Mm -hmm. Nobody. Nobody won. Mm -hmm. For what? Some motherfucking money that don't even exist? Right. That's that's a, that's an image, that's an illusion, that's fiat by decree. And they said you did 20 million. Yeah. Yeah. 20 million. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let's not act like you know you yeah. said some money, but let's not act like it was 100 bands. Yeah, yeah. 20 million. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's some next level shit right yeah, there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know what I look back, man, and I I I ask myself so many times without I look at it, would I, somebody asked me, would you do it all over again? If you understood what I was going through at the time and where my mind frame was at, I only felt that that was the only way out. Right, right. So I put myself in a self-enclosed mental space to think about shit. So now I'm only, I'm telling myself, I'm limiting myself from options to choices. Mm -hmm. There's a difference, my nigga, between options and choices. Mm -hmm. I had options, but I say I only got choices. But I really had options. And so when I put that mind frame on, this is these are the choices I got to make now. It's, it's, it's do or die, balls against the wall. No matter what, I'm going to go get this money by whatever means necessary so that I could take care of my family. Right. But that's a selfish way of thinking. Mm-hmm. Because with anything in these streets, any crime, anything you do, for every act, there's a repercussion. Mm -hmm. That didn't weigh out in my mind. Right. I'm looking at the short game, not the long term. Right. <clears throat> Sometimes we cut our own nose off the spot of face. face, yeah. And so that's what I was doing. I've always said that, bro. I've never gotten away with anything because karma never loses an address. It you may does. you may get away <laughs> with it, but you don't get away with it. And you live life long enough, it'll teach you how to live. It you understand that? Will because you I never got away with anything. Yeah, because I mean either. And so <laughs> everything that I thought I got away yeah. with. You know, yeah, I might have got away with it, <laughs> but I didn't. Life exactly. served me up some other shit. Yeah, yeah. In yeah, place yeah. of that. Exactly. You know? And so that time was a culmination. Mm-hmm. But sometimes things don't happen to us. Mm -hmm. They truly happen for us. And so when you understand mm -hmm. that it took me a minute to come to that, maybe God didn't do that to me. He did it for me. Yeah, he put you on the shelf, saved your life probably. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because imagine if you had because, still been out. Exactly. It could have been worse. Oh, yeah. It would have definitely you know I mean? been a lot worse because the way I was living, mm -hmm. I go work out every day. I just came from working out. Everybody mm -hmm. know? I just got from up under 385 right now. Yeah, because you was bigger when I seen you. Oh, about, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was definitely was bigger. bigger. Yeah, you know, I had fried chicken, nigga, right in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> That's some chicken in my pocket, nigga. I so, thought that was money. Nigga, oh, was no, they, no. That was chicken. No, nigga, the shit was wrapped up, nigga, in a piece of napkin, just in case. It was emergency pack. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah, but 
I just went in there. Yeah. Did 300 push-ups, jumped number 385, got on the machine with my auntie. We did the machine. Back then, I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Mm -hmm. I pull up and order a triple cheeseburger, goddammit. Damn. You know, I wasn't conscious of carbs. Right. I didn't right. know how <clears throat> you, carbs break down in your system and produce all of this motherfucking glucose. And Hell yeah. System, and where your body can't digest exactly. that shit. Exactly. I didn't know what your bicep or your tricep or rear deltoid or front deltoid or yeah. what your quads were. I didn't understand any of this, what testosterone or your yeah. hormones were. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't know none of this shit. So so basically it sounds like, God damn it, you did your time. Your time didn't do you. Exactly. So, I read 483 books in there. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And you I, also ran into Harry O in there, too. Definitely. Definitely. Talk about Harry O, the OG. Oh, man, the OG. He home right now. He right? is home. Okay. And I have seen him. Shouts out to Harry O. I've definitely seen him. I'm so proud of him, man, and I'm so happy for him. I'm really happy for him, man. Mm -hmm. He did my time five times mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. So imagine me doing my whole term. But doing it again, doing it again, and doing it again. Mm -hmm. That's some shit, bro. Yeah. And he's still sane and functional. Has but his facilities not to about. lose his will and his vigor for life. Right. And to be educated in the want, to know, the knowledge, and to continuously educate himself on every level. Out of everybody that I knew that lived in that dorm, this man had three lockers full of books. Wow. This man was a voracious reader. I think the other day I was speaking to somebody and I remember he gave me a book by Aggie Mandino. Mm -hmm. Then he gave me another book, me and him, we went back and forth on the Everything Store about Jeff Bezos. Then there was an outside other guy who wrote a book about Jay-Z. We used to just read all of these books, Creatures from Jekyll Island. We are read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, yeah. Retire Young, Retire Rich, Cash Flow Quadrant, What the Rich Invest In. Did you uh, read Why Do uh, Why Should White White Guys Have All the Fun? Yeah, exactly. That's a dope yeah. book, and it's always yeah. up in there, man. It's uh -huh. been, been had it floating around for a long, long time. Man. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> definitely had that book in there floating around for a while. But um, it was just so many different books, man, that I was able to read. Second Chance. Mm -hmm. Um. 50 Laws of Power, 48 yeah. Laws of Power. 50 Laws of Power is a dope book. I mm -hmm. think people need to read that. It's definitely educational to an extent. And it tells yeah, you a for lot sure. about 50. For sure. But also the way that Robert Greene breaks it down. Mm -hmm. um, that was the last book that I read while I was in prison. I read that book three times and I read 48 Laws of Power twice. Wow. So, I mean, <clears throat> they always say you want to hide something from a nigga, put it in a book. Mm. I mean, did you, you know... Did you feel like, because it sounds like when you went to prison, you got an awakening, you know what I'm saying? So from reading all those books and kind of finding yourself and being exposed to the information, did you, did it, did it create a different person? Because, you know, it, yeah, looking definitely. back on your old self, you were kind of just what it was. What it was. Book, yeah, you know definitely. I mean? um, yeah, it opened my mind, man, and it spread my wings and it let me see things from a different perspective. Earlier, I said, you know, niggas become s cynical and foolish. Mm -hmm. You know, a cynic is a person that can't embrace a new ideal. Right. And a fool is too foolish to keep a foolish ass scheme out of his motherfucking mind. Mm -hmm. They reside on the same sides of reality. People say that they're open minded, but are they truly open minded? Are they willing to question themselves, deeply reflect on themselves, say, what if what I thought about things this whole time was wrong. Right. When you can question yourself and you open enough to have that real conversation with yourself. And I know it's a lot of niggas out here like, how does, <laughs> does this nigga even make sense? That makes complete when, sense if you know. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know. If you understand the human mind, the human mind has over 80,000 thoughts in a day. Mm -hmm. How many motherfuckers think about what they're thinking about? Mm -hmm. Have you thought about that other thought? Yeah, nigga, you the one who listening to this right now, what I'm saying. <laughs> Did you think about that thought before that thought while you was listening to me? <laughs> and if you really thought about that thought while you was listening to me, did you think about the other thought? So when you begin to think about what you're thinking about, when you're being able to question yourself in another place, then you become open to a lot of different shit. Mm -hmm. You know, like, damn, you know? When you can ask yourself those deep ass questions, then you have the ability to start seeking it. 
it was a beautiful thing that I had read all of these books about financial literacy, how the Federal Reserve was created, when it was created, mm -hmm. when the IRS was created, understanding how, you know, how taxes came into play. Right. You know, the taxes were only meant for the rich. But the rich understood something that those before them knew, you know, on the first voyages, you know, to find new land. You know, back then, <clears throat> they would come together and put their money together. And so they'd say, all right, we're going to go find some new land and we're going to find oil, spices, gold. So they'd put a bunch of sailors on a boat and just get out there. The motherfucking boat get lost to sea. You done left all of these women and these children without fathers or whatever, and they get sued. So what they would do is in that times, in the 1400s, 1500s, they created what we know today as corporations. Mm -hmm. So when the lawsuits would come in and they would sue for the debt of it, it would go to a corporation. It would be an outside entity. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the 1800s and whenever you see, you know, the rich people in, in, in Europe, they was, hey, we want, you know, the rich need to be taxed. The rich people got smart. Oh. Y'all want us to be taxed. Okay. That's cool. Go put all our money in this corporation here. Mm -hmm. But everybody was being taxed. Mm -hmm. So the brunt of the weight came down on the poorest of the people in society. When you understand in 1930 that the Federal Reserve was created by a bunch of wealthy men, John Pierre Morgan, Paul Warburg, the Rothschilds. These dudes masqueraded like they was going on a hunting trip and went to a little small island called Jekyll Island. And there they laid down the foundation of what we know today as the Federal Reserve mm. and the f fractional banking that you see in the banking cartels. And they created what we know today as the Fed. And fiat, which in Latin means by decree, which means all of our money is by decree of the government. That's why when you look at cryptocurrencies like Ethereum and Bitcoin mm -hmm. and when they were created in their inception like in 2009 in this white paper that he wrote and understand you see countries like Venezuela these people are top oil producers gold producers these you look at all of these countries but hyperinflation and the printing of money y'all gotta understand and I know it's a lot of people out here listening this man just put 1.9 trillion dollars into the economy Mm -hmm. But what y'all didn't know is if today you walked inside of a bank and you gave the bank one dollar under the Federal Reserve banking rules, it could lend ten dollars against it. So where do you think that one point nine trillion dollars going to the banks? So this man just put 20 trillion dollars of fiat currency in the market. Wow. In one fell swoop. When your motherfucking Fed chairman come out and said there's no risk of hyperinflation, wake your game up. Right. Stay nah, safe. That's, that's real shit. Stay safe. <laughs> and now, hence, we see how, t what, 15 years ago, you could get 20 million. You yeah. know what I'm saying? These <laughs> niggas think they scamming. You had the mind to do 20 million. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> these motherfuckers doing cash app scams and he 20 million. You know what I mean? Oh, so man. now we see why. You know, that they, they told me that. They said, Black, you, you know... <laughs> Niggas, it's cool. They rap now about scamming. <laughs> He's like, nigga, nigga I, I am I the scam. I took 30,000 yeah. credit cards in my indictment. <laughs> nigga, go on Pacer.com and pull my case up. Yeah. Nigga, you yeah. and me my whole discovery. Right. And nigga, I, I hit for 30,000 numbers. Yeah, yeah. I, well, you know, the federal government, yeah. they was on my ass. <laughs> Y'all talk about scamming now. I was doing this shit, <laughs> yeah, almost yeah. 10 years ago yeah, before my, my folks was... Motherfuckers were still still taking the blocks and putting them in the pot, <laughs> cooking them down. Nigga, I, I had it on a piece of plastic yeah. walking in. <laughs> Thank you. Approval. <laughs> Thank you, too. Real talk. Yeah. So, I mean, you did your time, bro. You home. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? You've been home, what, eight months? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, obviously, you, you know... I've always known you to have a brilliant mind. Even when we met right, years right. ago, I was like, that's why we clicked. Because I was like, right. damn, homie sharp. You know right, what I'm saying? Right, right. It seems like you even sharper that you didn't came home. Right, you know right, what right, right. What do you, what's what's in the, in the you know, what's on the board now for Gorilla Black? Oh, man, right now, man, I'm, I'm really right now just, you know, my brother definitely, he's been definitely pivotal. And I've been working, you know, with my management boss lady and, I'm just cutting records, man, and, you know, we doing shows, we doing features, we doing everything, and, you know, I got the right people around me, and I, I didn't always believe like this. Mm -hmm. 
the last 11 months before I left prison, I had wrote over 600 verses. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I, I picked up my pen after they killed Nip. It crushed me so bad because, you know, I knew Nip for so long, man, and we were part of that first situation. Mm-hmm. You know, we were over there with Cinematic, with Johnny Shapiro and all of them before. So you knew Nip personally? Yeah, I knew him personally. Oh, okay. Personally, personally. Okay. Yeah, this, yeah. Before he even had a deal with okay. Johnny Shapiro and Sony Epic, we had a deal with Cinematic Island Def Jam. Yeah. And so I remember the conversations that took place and about that situation and about who Johnny Shapiro was and telling Nip about who he was at the time, even though, you know, Big U was working with him mm-hmm. and Steve Lobel mm-hmm. because we already had a situation there. Mm-hmm. So um, <clears throat> I remember over at 1500 or Nothing's house and when Glasses had took me over there and- Shout out to 1500 and Nothing's house. Exactly, yeah. exactly, <laughs> exactly, man. The homies definitely stay grinding. Yeah. But, uh, you know, shout out, you know, to the homie Cousy Capone and my boy Jay Stone as well. Um, Especially my nigga Kavi Supreme, nigga. I love you, boy. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, uh, definitely. Um, when you look at all of them and look at all of those, you know, situations that was going on at the time, and you know, a lot of times I never forget when I bought my Benz, we went to statewide. <laughs> I took forty thousand cash up there. I took forty six thousand cash. He wanted forty six thousand. I got sixty thousand of it. I said, okay, all right. Well, fuck it. I want to buy that uh, Lexus for my wife or whatever not. And so Nip bought a two-door. It was about two cars down, man. And I'll never forget that, man. I Just, man, every time. And before we had them, I had a 750 Li, and he had a blue 745 Li. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And we used to be going to the different clubs and everything, man. He just had this genuine, cool-ass spirit, my nigga. He just had this calm ass spirit about himself, man. But he was well self assured about himself. Yeah. He was an intelligent, self taught black man that was assured what he wanted to do, who he wanted to be, and where he wanted to see his community at, man. And it was a travesty, man, to see that happen on that level. Yeah. Because that took a big piece out of LA's heart because that boy man was going to be phenomenal. For sure. And so to see that, I'll never forget when I called my brother. I said, man, is this shit true? He said, he gone, Black. And I, I'm on a 15-minute phone call from the feds. He like, Black, he gone, Black. The homie gone. <clears throat> we couldn't even believe this shit. We just sitting in, we just stunned, like, just. It was Did you just, know shit he cuz? You know him too? I don't know him. Okay. I never knew him. Okay. I never knew him. Yeah. So so right now you you back in the swing of the music shit. Any other business ventures or anything? Yeah, definitely, man. I got a hair care company that, you know, we do alopecia oil, you know, for invisible, you know, edges, for balding, psoriasis of the scalp. I got and we use, I'm fuck with it. Yeah, and yeah. we use all 100% essential oils, grapeseed oil, almond oil, shea butter, all of the oils that were used for 5,000 years you know, in India and in Africa that our ancestors have used for hundreds of years, thousands of years pretty much, have, you know, essentially been used. And so we combined all of these oils. And so I came up with the concept a while back, you know, I've always had a, you know, a salon on Rosecrans mm-hmm. and Prairie. And so I started seeing women coming in with invisible edges. And, you know, I just, you know, to see black women, you know, their hair is their crown. Our queens, that's their crown. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times they don't know that the products that they're using is actually causing more harm to their hair. Mm -hmm. They're just stripping the oils off of the hair, the essential oils that our bodies develop because African-American hair is different from all of the rest of these, you know, Mm -hmm. people's hair. We're different. Our genetic makeup. You think those weaves are are doing an injustice to the hairlines and and the hair as well? I mean, when you look at it, it's the thing of it is how well they're taking care of their hair. Mm-hmm. A lot of them are putting all of these different shampoos in there, mm-hmm. like Vidal Sassoon and all of these other. That's not made for your hair. Mm-hmm. That's stripping your hair. Right. But when you start using essential oils, you when you start mis- massaging and re-stimulating your scalp and adding, like hair gods, mm-hmm. we're using all natural Dope. stuff. Dope. And so, yeah, this is a company, you know, for the beard. You know, I didn't groom a beard out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? My yeah, when well, we met, neither one of us had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah, definitely yeah, back did. In old, yeah. old I remember when I met you, man, you had your hair swinging along, man. Nigga, you my shit old, was, nigga, my shit was long and long, luxurious, long nigga. Long and luxurious yeah. and extremely <laughs> silky smooth. Hell yeah, exactly. you know what I'm saying? And so, yeah, but uh, definitely, I have a company that, and you know, my brother has a company called 
called Hair Spy LA. So you okay. can go to hairguys.com and you'll see my products there. Mm-hmm. And you can go to Hair Spy LA. Dot com and my brother's products are there and we we definitely we do pretty much a lot of e-commerce dope, dope. and so that's something in which i've learned about you know yeah. coming home and how that actually works and getting into that but i've been recording a lot of music man and i think that the direction in which i'm going now with this new project and i'm just cutting songs right now okay. just cutting songs cutting songs so you're going to continue to hear new music from me I'm really on a whole nother level and a whole nother page in the way that I think about things. And I wouldn't have been that way without, you know, my management really, really believing in me. You know, I be I remember when I first met her, I was at my office and I'm in there putting my oils together and she like, You do know that you're a brand too. Right. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. She teaching you right. Yeah. You do That's remember right. who you are, right? I'm like, yeah, Queen, I know who I am. Yeah, yeah. but sometimes you need people to remind you of that. You need, yeah, but they see, have you to do. remind you. But the yeah. way she said it was uniquely <laughs> different from what everybody else said. She had this little, she got this quirky little, you do know who you are, right? <laughs> I got the scratch in my head. Yeah, I remember who I am. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, this is a brand, but you're a brand, right? You know what? I am a brand. Right. And so her belief in me and her wanting me to get back out here and started making me like, you know what? Fuck that shit. Let me get out here. Let me get back in that booth real quick. Yeah. So I want to touch on one last thing <clears throat> before we go, bro. Because right. it's been a very enlightening conversation. Right, right, it's right. dope, man. You, you know, your, your conversation is stimulating. You know Definitely. what I mean? Um, so you did, you got out, you did your interview with Vlad. Right, right. right. That's a good look. That's a big platform. Right. Um, so, you know, here recently, right. BG Knockout. Right. You know, shout out to the, to the OG BG Knockout. You know right, what I'm saying? Right. He was kind of, I, I guess, I, I'm not going to say question because I don't want to be incendiary with what I'm saying, but right. you know, he right. was basically trying to figure out your affiliation, you being from Compton. Right. And you saying. Right. The, the Harlems. You right, know, right, yeah. right. And I think you earlier, know, yeah, I think I elaborated on it, but we can go into it in yeah. detail. You know, like I said to you earlier, mm-hmm. when I got introduced to Big Rich, Big Rich, you know, come out of that way of the Harlems. Mm-hmm. So back then in that era, they started bringing me and building studios up around me and bringing me over there around them. And so that's when I got ingratiated with my family. Mm-hmm. So we can, so we're clear. Yeah, so yeah. for the people that don't yeah. know, Harlem Thirty Crips. Harlem Thirty Crips from exactly. in L.A. Okay, Dinka Park Crips. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Right. Thumbs. So mm. when I started being around them dudes, them dudes, it wasn't so much as just banging. Mm-hmm. It was just to the point of me, them being the first people to really help to develop me and really work with me. And not only that, but them was my family members. Right. So like I said, since I was the time of 16 years old, the homies is the niggas who raised me. Mm-hmm. And these is the niggas who gained me. Mm-hmm. You know, my nigga Big Crypto, my nigga Big Peen, my nigga Killer Watt, the homie JB. Shout out to my nigga Capone. Hope you coming home soon, homie. You know, Lil Watt, all of these dudes mm-hmm. that's over there. You know, my nigga Big Dav, my big homie. All of these is my homies that raised me. Right. So, nigga, if you have any question, nigga, yeah, run the file and you will definitely see what it is and who it is who raised me and who I've been around. I done did thousands of shows with the homies Mm -hmm. and y'all know who the homies is. So you're so just because so you're saying that you grew up in Compton. Yeah. You spent your time in Compton. But you you was with from from L.A. Exactly. 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 So that don't what is that supposed to lessen the fact that I've. From went Compton. to Whaley, right, went to right. Compton, so right. dope, lived all over Compton, been yeah. to, and Compton my whole life. What is yeah. that? Nigga, I'm still a Compton. Nigga, yeah. nigga, I'm just from Harlem, huh? Yeah. Nah, it's just like me, bro. I'm in Kansas City, I'm from a spot called Faux Block. Right. I'm born and raised there. Right. But there was a period in my life where I ran with a, a clique called Southside Posse, right. who were Crips as well as Faux right. Block. Right, right. But they was on. They was out south. Yeah, exactly. You know what I'm saying. So I get what you're saying. Right. It doesn't mean that I'm any less yeah. from Faux Block because yeah. I was running with yeah, another but I was crew. I was in the Palmers. You know and if you want to, if, yeah. if you want to know that I was in the Palmers, all mm-hmm. if you go ask my nigga Big Nate, you go ask niggas that's from over there. My nigga Capone, all of them from over. Them niggas been knowing me forever. My nigga Big Dink, all of them niggas been over there forever in a day. My nigga Dave Mo, you know, all of them niggas was over there. My brother from Palmer. So I mean, yeah. you got to understand. 
the dynamics of that, yeah. of them raising me and coming and influencing me with my music career, so I would only be inherently, you know, around niggas from Harlem. Right. So it's just natural from the time me being in my teens, yeah. these is the people who I'm with. I'm making music with them. I'm from Harlem. I got you. And these are my homies. And them is, and so, you know, everywhere and everybody in L.A., when you run the file back all the way for 15 years, this ain't nothing new. Yeah. And I don't think, I never, you know, maybe BG didn't know, but I seen the way, you know, Vlad asked him the question. Right. But I explained this on Vlad right. the same exact way. Yeah. But shout out to DJ Vlad. Yeah, yeah. You know, I just wanted to, because you my guy, you know what I mean? I don't know Vlad or BG, so I wanted shout to. Shout out to BG. I I wa- yeah, shout out to both of them. But I, you know, I wanted to give you But a that's chance. why I wanted to clear it up. Yeah. I want to, to clear, to let me clear, clear it up. up. Yeah. And you know, yeah. it's no love lost, and I definitely yeah. love both of them, but I'm making sure that it's clear. Right, right. And you know, right. you know, Drace to know my homie, you know. BG know yeah. who Drace is, and Drace to know the homie Killer Nitty, and Killer Nitty could explain it very, very well. Yeah. So it's nothing new. Right. You know, shout out to you know all of them. You know, I'm from Compton, homie, but I'm just from Harlem, homie, and that's just what it is. Hey, that's what it is, bro. Definitely. So listen, on this show, bro, you know what I mean? You know, the Holding Court Podcast, bro. I like to bring people on here to give them mm-hmm. the flowers while they yeah, still definitely, here. definitely, man. You know what I'm saying? I, I so appreciate that, Me and man. you go back to <laughs> 15, 16 years, you know what I'm saying? Right, so, right. you know, you did your time, bro. You know, you had hit records. You you went to prison. You came home. You educated yourself. You changed your life. You turned it around. Right. You know what I'm saying? And now you seem to be a, a, a positive force, right. a positive beacon of light in the, in the community. You know right, what I mean? Exactly. So I just want to give you your flowers, bro. Tell you I appreciate you. You know what I mean? And keep being great. Keep doing what you're doing, bro. You know, and you know I'm here, bro. You know, we go back. So right. I know we rebuilding from here. You right. know what I'm saying? And especially, you know, we older and we more mature, more polished at this point. Right. But, you know, shit, man, you got a home here always. Definitely, man. allies And I really well. appreciate you being able to bring me here and be, you know, transparent with me and me sitting here with you, man, Court, because, you know, this has been in the making for so long and I'm, a pr- I'm really proud of where you've come from from then as being that young kid with the little pony tails out there just rapping just <laughs> yeah. trying trapping buying homes you know what i'm saying moving from kansas city to a place you didn't even yeah, know man. to get out here man yeah. and to build up and to be working with p as long as you have bro and it's good that as kings we give each other our flowers absolutely and i really appreciate you having this platform for me to be able to talk about my life in the way that for I sure for sure and you you know this is always a home for you bro anytime you want to come through you know that you know because i want to i want to normalize this type of shit you know what i'm saying exactly, and like exactly. you said communicating exactly you know that's I mean? the beautiful thing man and that's definitely a beautiful thing and i really appreciate you and your mans man definitely here and I hope to come, man, soon and do some more work with hey, you. Hey, we're going to do more than this. I definitely, yeah, we I gotta do, get that, man, uh, looking around, I hope we do do more. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do more I than this, I look like it's a lot more Because you know on. I put you in a movie before. Oh, exactly, you know exactly. So I'm so. trying to do some more movies. Yeah. You got to get that product placement. You know? Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. you got to give us the product. We need oh, de- oh, yeah, I'm going to definitely get the yeah. product. Yeah. yeah. Boss lady, the product. <laughs> yeah, you know I'm in your inbox. You know I ain't got no problem inboxing you. You know what I'm saying? But, yeah, man, it's all love, bro. I want to thank you for coming, man. Definitely. You know what I'm saying? And this is home. Bro, man, Kansas City, the Compton, like the songs. KC, the Compton, <laughs> man, you already know what it is. All right, all love. Man. All right, baby. Yeah. One.